Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we have with us our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so different, also, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And we have Orange Seal Off Roads, Hannah Finchamp. What's up, Hannah? Hi, good to be here again. Yeah, we were just talking before this podcast. It's exciting. Uh, your, your wedding date isn't far away. Yeah, November 6th. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, it was delayed because of the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so, two and a half year engagement going on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yep, join the club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, similar vote. So congratulations, Hannah. That's super exciting. Um, we probably won't have you on the podcast until December again, because uh, we're going to be at Cape Epic basically throughout October. And then uh, with some some episodes that you'll be hearing along the way through that. And then after that, you'll be on your honeymoon as well. So uh, we'll probably have you back on. And then, of course, we have a holiday here, Thanksgiving in the United States. So we'll have you on once uh, we get to December. So it's exciting to have you on. Thanks for coming. Yeah. So everyone mark your calendars for December. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yes. You can follow Hannah on Instagram. You can follow Trainer Road on Instagram as well. Uh, you can go, if you go onto YouTube right now, you can see all those links to the different channels and you can find Hannah, find all of us on there. It's good fun. Chad even has an Instagram, but it's kind of like an Easter egg if you can find him. Uh, and if you find him, I'm not sure Chad spends a lot of time logged into Instagram. So yeah. last time yeah, was probably beers much. with Chad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it was. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, I want to mention one thing really quick. Uh, well, first of all, we're going to talk about athletes, insulin, carbohydrate, the relationship that exists between all of that today. Um, so really some really good insights. It's going to be super, uh, uh, really good stuff. We even have some really great visuals. Uh, and I just want to give credit to Piper and Babs. Uh, they are two members of our team here at trainer road that, uh, aren't public faces on the podcast, but they very much are very involved in everything you see from trainer road. So, uh, Piper is one of our motion graphics and video editors that does a lot of the video content you see across our TikTok channels, Instagram, YouTube, everything else. And Babs is, uh, she provides almost everything you see on the marketing side. If it's a visual, anything, uh, she's behind it. So thank you to Piper and Babs and all the people here at trainer road that, uh, don't get to be seen on this podcast, but, um, are absolutely a part of the team. We appreciate it. So, uh, okay. For a blog articles. I want to share some really cool things that we've been releasing recently. Uh, we released one threshold intervals for cyclists benefits, examples, and tips for success. Kudos to Megan. Awesome copywriter that was working on that one. We also have, um, uh, a number of different things, uh, on the successful athletes podcast that's coming out right now. Uh, Lauren Hackney was the episode that we did recently. She struggled, uh, Hannah, this is possibly relatable to you. She started in try, this has been her focus, but she struggled even at first to finish a 20 K bike leg, like just riding that was physically hard. Uh, and then, and she's a nurse as well. So she's, and she's in the middle of the craziness of the pandemic. And for some reason, when the onset of the pandemic hits, she thinks, I need a goal to really drive me through this. So I'm going to train for a full Ironman, a uh, full distance try. And that's what I want to do. Uh, and she used trainer road and prep for that and went from the 20 K bike leg to being a true weakness to being the part that she was like looking forward to most in her relative strength, super cool story. And she also made all of that effort uh, to raise awareness for a charity that uh, helps medical professionals find the, the necessary resources to take care of themselves amidst such crazy things uh, that they're going through right now with COVID and everything else. Just a fantastic episode. And coming up, we're going to have an episode with Thorne Bickle, and this is on the Successful Athletes podcast. Again, you can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. And Thorne is, uh, he, I think he's going to be the first Enduro national champion that we've had on the podcast. It's super cool. And he's from Utah, just like Hannah in this case. So really cool one that we recorded with him as well. Um, an update on adaptive training. The open beta has been giving us fantastic progress. It's super exciting. Stay tuned for more updates on that. Uh, we're, and you can also give adaptive training a shot. If you have a trainer road account, all you have to do is just go to your account and then you can find an early access area, just flip the switch and you can turn it right on and you'll be all set. Uh, that's super exciting. Uh, but also if you don't have a trainer road account, get one, uh, it's the best way to get faster. Okay. And then, uh, finally, if somebody has been using adaptive training and you've had any form of improvement, achievement, accomplishment, whatever you want to call it, uh, can you reach out to me, go to trainerroadcom slash SAP. 
and share your experiences of how adaptive training has made you faster. Uh, it, it'll be really cool to help tell some stories here, uh, specifically on how it helped, uh, different folks. Now that people are getting time with it and using it, uh, it's been cool to see how many of you are getting faster. So, uh, that covers all the pre stuff and Chad, I think we should just go right in to Seamus's question. No shallow dive first this week. It's, uh, we're starting off deep. Let's just get this done. <laughs> Let's do it. It says, hello, podcast host. I thoroughly enjoy the podcast, the app, and all the content you create on your blog and the YouTube channel. You got me properly stuck into the TR ecosystem, and I'm getting faster than I've ever been. Good to hear, Seamus. Good to have you with us. You go to trainerroad.com and sign up like Seamus did. He says, I have a question that came up after recent discussions on increasing carbohydrate intake. Having a close friend who is a diabetic, I'm a bit embarrassed to admit that I don't understand the sugar and insulin relationship that our bodies have. Does insulin spike every time we eat sugar? Isn't that bad? And if so, are we risking becoming diabetics by upping our carbon take on the bike through pure sugar water? I've never felt truly comfortable with asking these questions as it seems a simple thing that most people understand that I simply do not, but perhaps I could take advantage of this safe place to ask such questions. Many thanks in advance from Seamus and Chad, that's a, that's a good, that's kind of one of the reasons that we're here, right? On that last part. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. I like that we're perceived as a safe place to ask tough questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Chad, uh, where do you want to start? Okay. So first, uh, I guess a bit of housekeeping. Let me just, just before we get to the discussion, uh, or answer the actual question, let's just keep it super general and say that anything regarding the human body is rarely simple. So first off, Seamus, you, you need not be uh, embarrassed for asking. And this, this holds especially true for nutrition. It's an ever complex, increasingly so. As you learn more, you realize you know less than, than you thought you did. And it's just a tough, tough matter. Very expansive topic. Um, additionally, if you're wondering, I, it's, it's been my experience that we're seldom alone in our ignorance. I mean, I, I think back to early days of college where I'm in a lecture class of 150 students and I have a question, but I don't dare ask it because I think, you know, everyone's going to think I'm an idiot because they all know the answer, but I'm somehow the one person who doesn't. And that just, it just doesn't carry. And inevitably someone asks that question and there I am sitting there going, Oh, good. Someone else wondered. And I promise you, I'm not the only one relieved by someone else having asked that question. <laughs> Okay. Secondly, um, and this will be a bit of a recurring theme over the course of this discussion. I may not say it explicitly at times, but it, the, the idea that endurance athletes are in fact a different class of human, the, 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 the stressors that we subject ourselves to bring about all sorts of changes in, you know, physiologically, obviously, but psychologically, uh, but biologically, it, it all ties together. But the fact is what applies to sedentary, normal folk, untrained or people who've never trained, will never train doesn't carry directly across to, to people who you know, basically take care of themselves, challenge themselves. <clears throat> okay. So now back to the actual topic, let's begin by discussing the mechanism of insulin, because, uh, as you've admitted, Seamus, you don't understand this and, and you assume that people do. And I promise you they don't, because the more I dug into this, the more I recognized that what I thought I knew was again, just, just a, a glaring example of how little I actually know. <laughs> so, um, for, for the sake of this discussion, we're going to kind of reduce insulin to a storage hormone. But with that said, I want to point out what Jake Kushner, who's a, a medical doctor, he is a, uh, pediatric endocrinologist who's worked for quite a long time with children and adults in, uh, relating to type one diabetes. He also knows quite a lot about type two diabetes as a result of that, of course, and just metabolic disorder in general. And he, and I'll summarize, but he basically says that insulin regulates every cell in the body. It basically decides if a cell is in feast or, or a famine state, you know, it decides, well, are we going to park nutrients in the cell, which is the storage I just referred to, or are we going to mobilize them for energy? So it, it's effectively the master regulator of cell nutrients. Okay. Hmm. So as long as we're clear on that, it's really easy to move forward and understand the importance and the impact of insulin. So 10,000 foot view. Uh, the pancreas organ in our, you know, our abdomens responds to hyperglycemia, uh, basically elevated blood sugar. And in doing so it releases insulin and this hormone actually serves to promote glucose uptake. So whether it comes from carbohydrate that you just ate it or glycogen that's ate that you ate or <laughs> glycogen that's broken down from your stomach, 
or geez, I'm really blowing it, your liver or your muscles. So glycogen breakdown or carbohydrate, either way, it's going to re get reduced to glucose. And this is the principal stimulus for insulin secretion. Now, couple that with glucagon, and I'm not going to go that direction because I think it muddies the waters, what we're talking about today, but that's the other side of things. Whereas, whereas uh, insulin is responsible for the uptake of glucose out of the bloodstream, glucagon is responsible for the release of glucose mm -hmm. into the bloodstream. And these two hormones basically form the basis for blood sugar regulation, but we're just going to focus on insulin. So while hyperglycemia or, you know, an, an increase in the sugar in your blood, basically carbohydrate is the trigger for insulin release. We also see a stimulation of insulin release due to amino acids and fatty acids. So the, the point is simple, just all macronutrients impact our insulin activity. Now on the outside of the cells, we have insulin receptors. So on the cell wall, insulin receptors inside of the cell, we have glucose transporters, and we're just going to keep it that simple. So insulin binds to these receptors in a, in a healthy adult with you know, proper metabolic function or a healthy person. And then the insulin binds to glucose and then the insulin signals to the glucose transporters inside of the cell to translocate, move from the inside of the cell, create a bridge to the outside of the cell so that we can bring glucose into the cell. Okay. So we're going to focus our spotlight on the insulin dependent uptake in the muscles to some extent, the liver, but, uh, basically the muscles and the fat tissue, the adipose. Okay. <clears throat> So within the liver, uh, insulin promotes the conversion of glucose to glycogen, right? That's one of the stores for glycogen, also triglycerides. So, so fats are form, formed and sometimes stored, unfortunately, in, in the liver cells. And at the same time, insulin inhibits the uh, glycogenolysis or the breakdown of glycogen. So we're not creating glycogen and breaking it down at the same time. Because remember, the, the goal here is to take sugar out of the blood, not create it and put it back in. Same thing with gluconeogenesis. We're not creating new glucose just to put it back in. So that as well is inhibited. Now within the fat or the adipose cells, it's pretty similar. It promotes glucose uptake, promotes the, the formation of triglycerides, got to store that fat, convert the glucose to fat, store it, and it inhibits the breakdown of fat. So it inhibit, inhibits lipolysis. Same idea. We're trying to take nutrients out of the bloodstream. And then when it comes to the muscle cell, it promotes that, that same thing, glucose uptake, formation of glycogen, inhibits the breakdown of glycogen, but it also promotes protein synthesis and inhibits the breakdown of protein. So there's a very obvious anabolic effect going on there and something you wouldn't think of, you don't typically relate insulin to protein metabolism, but it is involved. Hmm. Now it's important to recognize that muscle absorbs roughly 80% of our blood glucose. So it is far and away our biggest sink of blood sugar. And, and just right now, just consider the implications on both the muscle storage capacity and the use specifically of glycogen, because both are affected by endurance training and both are points of concern in sedentary individuals. And this is the first example of how indeed endurance athletes are a different class of human. So mm -hmm. can't, definitely not an apples to apples comparison. This is, uh, we, we can't, we mentioned something similar to this pretty regularly than the fact that almost regardless of topic, when you're looking at it, the general recommendations that exist for average people many times are tailored toward the sedentary individual and not the, the endurance athlete. It's kind of a different, it's a different approach. I'm sure you saw that too, just going throughout your schooling and everything else as well, Hannah, it's like two different camps that you deal with. Yeah. And I think in this, it's important to note too, you know, I think people hear fat and adipose tissue and they panic a little bit. But for those of us, which is probably everyone, if you're listening to this podcast, who's an, who's an athlete or an endurance athlete, you don't have to be worried about getting fat while you're right. riding up, taking that glucose, which I think kind of goes back to the top of that question a little bit is if you're riding and you're intaking this sugar water, you don't really have to worry about whatever's being stored in fat or storing in fat making you fat. So just to clarify, please don't worry about that while you're riding. You are definitely not taking in too much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's super good advice. Cause boy, it's easy to get your head wrapped up into that. And then to do kind of like the advice that Amber is always warned against, don't diet on the bike. She exactly. said, mm -hmm. but it's really easy to let our minds <clears throat> from an, from a sedentary state, let our minds go over and trespass into that active state and to, to guide us in bad directions when it should not even be there. 
Especially um, as you're getting close to the end of a ride. I know a lot of people, it's like, okay, I only have 45 minutes left. I'm really hungry, but I can make it these last mm, 45 mm, minutes. Not worth point. it. Just, just eat something. It's for the best all around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the interjection there, Chad. Um, no, no, carry on. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, to sum it up, there are basically three goals of ins insulin secretion. First off is to enclose, uh, sorry, increase glucose uptake, right? Decrease the circulating glucose, basically the, the sugar in the blood, and then to increase stored energy. These are the, these are the three end games. So yes, blood sugar elevations largely dictate insulin secretion. And hence this is the concern around frequent spikes. So it's, it's understandable that this is a concern, especially having uh, someone in your circle of friends who's a, who's a diabetic and deals with this in a much realer nature. So the question kind of becomes, should blood sugar spikes be a concern for an endurance athlete? And the short answer, unfortunately, is yes, but with a big caveat, if you can't get the excess blood sugar out of your bloodstream, that's where the concern lies. And that is, is basically the crux of the matter here. We as endurance athletes typically don't have a problem clearing that, that blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to the, the matter of glucose transport. So glucose has to be actively transported into fat and muscle cells. I think it's passive transport into the liver. I'm not entirely sure. It doesn't matter. Active transport into the fat and muscles. So insulin signals to the, these glucose transporters that I mentioned earlier, and they undertake translocation, moving from the inside to the outside, creating a channel such that we can get sugar into the, into the cell so that it can either pack it away or do some work. Now, in the case of fat and muscle, GLUT4 is the glucose transporter of choice. And you don't, it, it's not that there are a number of glucose transporters, there are sodium transporters, there are a lot of different ways to, to move these nutrients about. But when we talk about endurance performance, it's almost always about muscle action and therefore it's going to be about GLUT4. So in fat cells, GLUT4 is necessary all the time. And, and this is important because if we don't clear the fats, then they're going to linger in the bloodstream. And that's, that's a problem in and of itself, but also the muscles can be potentially undernourished and the stores understocked. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when, when it comes to muscle cells though, and I think we have a animation to demonstrate this glucose actually has a couple means of entry into the muscles. So there's, there's GLUT4 insulin dependent transport, but there's also a non insulin dependent mechanism. Effectively muscles have a back door. And this is exercise induced GLUT4 translocation. And we've talked about this in previous podcasts, but the important point here is that exercise enhances both the insulin dependent and the non insulin dependent means of translocation. Okay. Mm. Yeah, and the visual that's showing on screen right now that you, that y'all can see is, um, uh, blame me for any oversimplification that exists on this one, by the way, as I was providing direction, I was trying to <laughs> convey a simple idea though. It's perfect. Yeah. To, to our artists here, but yeah, it shows that it's a totally different ball game, right? Chad, when you are in an active state versus sedentary state, whereas insulin is present and doing a job in that sedentary state, when you're active, that's it's, it's not there. It's, it's, yeah, it's parking yeah. the bus. If we're asking our muscles to use energy, we're really good at furnishing it. So all sorts of accommodations are made to, to help us do work. Yeah. Whereas when we're in that state or that sedentary state, it is a different game and insulin is taking care of the very job that it's been assigned. Right. So, um, it's a, th this should hopefully help you understand how different it is, uh, for endurance athletes taking in fuel when they're on the bike versus just taking in fuel as a sedentary individual and, and, and doing that. So very different mm -hmm. cases. Yep. Good yeah. point. Okay. So let me try to summarize glucose transport qu quite simply, just step you through the, the steps. So basically carbohydrate comes into the system or glycogen is broken down and it makes it into the bloodstream. And this, this is what hyperglycemia is. So an elevation in blood sugar, the pancreas re, re, re uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for releases. That's it releases insulin into the blood. And we get an expression of insulin receptors on the cells, right? The insulin then binds to these insulin or insulin receptors. The sugar binds to the insulin. The insulin tells the glute four to translate to the outside of the cell. Contraction does this too. Glucose makes it into the cell. The cell stores or uses this glucose and the insulin is degraded by the liver and the kidneys. Okay. So that's the whole process start to end. Now the relevance here is that, that exercise increases both the concentration or the expression of GLUT4. 
And, and, and we must maintain insulin sensitivity in order to signal to these glute transporters, these glucose transporters. If we don't, we're getting no, or, or at best limited nutrient entry into the cell and the nutrients just remain in the bloodstream. So it's problematic on two sides, two sides there. So this accumulation can lead to resistance to the effects of insulin. And this brings us to the matter of insulin resistance which really could be reduced to just the consequences of chronic hyperglycemia. So if your blood sugar stays elevated on a chronic basis, a routine, consistent basis, this is where the issues, when the issues arise. Mm. So really simply defined insulin resistance is basically when the liver, the muscles, the adipose simply don't respond appropriately to insulin. And this leads to circulating levels of blood sugars and, and blood fats that remain high which leads to uh, myriad metabolic pathologies. And you mentioned type two diabetes, and this of course is one of the major concerns, but man, there are, there are things as bad and arguably worse. So quickly, just to distinguish between type one and type two diabetes, type one is when there's, there's a lack of insulin due to an auto, autoimmune disorder. So basically the body doesn't recognize and therefore attacks the, the beta cells in the pancreas and insulin production goes down, 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 and you know, can eventually quit entirely. And insulin has to be introduced into the system exogenously. It has to come from outside of the body. Whereas with type two diabetes, this is simply an overproduction of insulin. And this comes about for reasons that we'll discuss, but this causes the desensitization of the insulin receptors. And typically it's, it's a result of energy surplus. Uh, specifically, it's basically eating more carbohydrate than you use. And it's not as simple as that, but when we're comparing sedentary folk with endurance athletes, it can be as simple as that. And it's a, it's a vicious cycle. And anytime I think of this particular cycle, I'm reminded of the phrase water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink, right? Because through, through a combination of both genetic and environmental factors and the environmental factors being, you know, namely diet exercise, and they typically say body weight, but let's call it what it is body fat. We're not considered with being heavy. We're considered with being over fat that leads to a decrease in insulin sensitivity. This leads to an increase in the production of insulin, and this increase in insulin production can lead to higher levels in sensitivity. Round and round we go, right? All the while, the pancreas is trying desperately to keep pace with demands placed on it by this chronically elevated blood glucose and blood lipids level. So put really simply, the nutrients can't get where they need to go. <clears throat> so one recommendation, just a bit of an aside here is that if you know, for whatever reason, you are genetically predisposed, you know, maybe because of uh, family history, maybe because you've had blood work done before, maybe because you just recognize your intake of carbohydrates and low blood sugar crashes, et cetera. I highly re recommend the involvement of a physician, but it's just, if, if, if you, if you're not already going down that path, go ahead and head down it right now from the environmental perspective, there's so much within our control. So genetics kind of out of our hands, how we express, express our genetics bit within our hands, environmentally, very much within our hands. And namely, again, we're going back to diet. And this, this refers to both the, the quality of what you eat and the quantity. So, so excesses simply can't be forgiven if you're a sedentary person. And then the quality of the food, man, that, that can range very widely. Also exercise. And then really, if you take care of diet and exercise, body fat kind of follows suit. You really don't have to actively chase that if you're doing those other two things correctly. Now, those, those are the three big hitters, but also you have to consider chronic stress. So if you're under a continuous stress load and you don't manage that stress well, this can impact your insulin sensitivity and sleep deprivation has a really big effect on it. And, you know, you never really have to sweat that one night of bad sleep, but that one night of bad sleep can lead to people actually presenting with pre-diabetic blood glucose numbers. So this just shows you how big of an impact sleep can have on your blood glucose. Yeah. You do that perpetually or consistently or chronically, then over time you can incur a certain level of insulin resistance. This all just shows like how important exercise is, right? Like, and, and how it's a necessary component of our existing, like to, to have activity, like our bodies are designed for it. You know, uh, it just seems to make very logical sense, particularly when you look at it in this light, it just does so many favorable things for us. Completely does. And I'm reading Daniel Lieberman's new book called, I think it's exercised, which uh -huh. basically counters everything you just said, <laughs> <I'm> really, <laughs> really struggling with it. It's, it's an interesting perspective though, regardless. Um, well, okay, one, so thing, one really quick thing, Chad, but this, uh, 
I want to point this out because so a lot of people might be listening to this and thinking like, oh my gosh, once again, remember sedentary versus active, very important thing to mention here. Um, and then on, on top of this too, isn't this like a great example of why we do these things? I know that somebody listening to this is like going for, you know, your main goal for the year is to set a new 40 K TTPR or something. And, or you are going for some specific achievement within cycling, but in the end, look at how much good you're doing for your body, right? Like, hmm. uh, the health that you're maintaining, kind of going back to what you said last week, Chad, about like being like a healthy individual first and a bike racer second, uh, sort of a yeah. thing in terms of a, a good approach for us with our, just our outlook on activity in general. This is another, uh, another good reason to focus mm -hmm. on that, to make yourself healthy first, yep. you know? Yeah. And, I yeah. think it could also be worth just super briefly in the, in the simplest way possible, explaining a little bit of what your body has to go through. If you don't give it that sugar, like having to go through finding energy through gluconeogenesis or something like that. Is that something that you're able to touch on just in a sentence or two? I, I can say that, that if we effectively malnourish based on the level of activity that we're inflicting on ourselves or asking of ourselves, that the body has coping mechanisms. I mean, it'll, it'll find energy from different places, but eventually those places peter out. And when they do, body starts the body starts getting pretty selective with what's necessary and what's not. It's like, okay, maybe I don't need my skin to be quite as soft or my hair to be quite as quite as vibrant, or maybe I don't need to maintain the same internal temperature. Maybe I can live being a degree or two colder. All the, all these things kind of are the sacrifices that you have to pay if you're not furnishing your body with enough nutrients to to support what you're asking of it. Mm. Not to mention the muscle breakdown that is likely going to be something that happens pretty readily, yeah. relatively speaking on that sliding scale. Of, it depends. Of yeah. Things. It depends where you're starting up. Yeah. Yeah. That's no good. doubt. Which usually flies in the face of performance, right? Um, uh, absolutely. And like you said, long-term, depending on how far you go down that road, absolutely mm -hmm. flies in the face of health. Um, mm -hmm. It's yeah. Yeah. Complicated. Yeah. Yeah. You guys Great are point. teasing good points that we're, we're going to get to. Cool. <laughs> okay, so <Look> at us. <laughs> no, that's good. Good conversation. Okay. So um, just a few more scary aspects of, of insulin resistance. Um, first it, it affects many different types of tissues and we're going to limit this discussion, but muscle, if you have limited blood gl glucose entry, then you're going to get reduced stored energy, which is good, basically going to manifest as low energy, right? Reduced work capacity for us as athletes and effectively undernourished muscles. When it comes to adipose tissue, we get desensitized to the effects of insulin and that leads to higher serum uh, triglyceride levels or, or really fat levels. So higher fat in the blood. And I linked to an article there um, on uh, how exercise actually alleviates lipid induced insulin sensitivity, just as a, just as a, a bit of a hopeful aspect to everything that seems pr pretty negative and, and is, but hang in there. Um, intramuscular triglyceride stores. So the fat that we actually store inside the muscle is, is basically is potentially harmful in sedentary individuals, but it actually is a boon for endurance athletes. And then this is something that's termed the athlete's paradox. And I linked to, I think a revisit of the athlete's paradox, but basically I think it, it just boils down to the fact is we use them and we thereby maintain their utility as yeah, the whole use it or lose it idea fat in the cells when we're not or in the muscle cells or any cells when we're not using it not a good thing, but if we're utilizing it, it's an energy resource. And then brain super, I'm going to touch on it just ever so briefly, but when you have compromised glucose uptake in the brain, you effectively have malnourished neurons, right? Malnourished uh, brain cells. And this has been repeatedly scientifically linked to numerous mental disorders. Some of the scariest ones. Hmm. Then <laughs> just there, this will get brighter. I promise there's one major threat. <laughs> another major threat of insulin resistance is that it can pave the way for metabolic syndrome. And undoubtedly you've heard this before, but it, it basically it plays its part in helping you fulfill a certain number of criteria, check so many boxes and you qualify for that distinguished, uh, just description. You, you have too big a waistline and that ties back to visceral fat, really, um, blood pressure. I'll touch on that in just a second elevated blood, blood triglycerides or blood fats. Just talked about that, uh, low HDL. So if you don't have those high density lipoproteins floating around, you can't really suck up cholesterol out of the bloodstream as well as you might. 
And then fasting blood glucose, which is based, is what we're talking about here. And I'll use this as an example of how you would check that box in the case of metabolic syndrome. So if you have chronically elevated fasting blood glucose, and, and typically this is measured via HbA1c, and I know that measures come under a bit of criticism, but man, it's so widely used. I have to believe there's something to it because it's, it's oh so relied upon, but this can give you an insight into your current level of insulin insensitivity. And all it is, is, is uh, all it is. It's a measure of glycated hemoglobin. So, so we know hemoglobin is the protein on our blood cells that binds oxygen, delivers it to the cells. Well, this hemoglobin can actually get glycated, which is basically sugar coated. And they can measure that level of sugar coating. And they can tell you not what your blood sugar is in the moment, but what your blood sugar has been over the past 80, 90, 100 days, because that's roughly the life of a red blood cell. So if this fasting blood glucose measure, this, this average measure over so many days falls in the ball, ballpark of hundred to 125, and that's <clears throat> excuse me, milligrams per deciliter. So milligrams of glucose in a deciliter of blood, or if you're measuring millimoles per liter, it'd be 5.6 to 6.9. But if you're in that bracket, you are uh, designated or classified as pre-diabetic. If I'm just a little above that, so now you're 126 milligrams per deciliter or 7.0 millimoles per liter, then you're classified as diabetic. So you know, how do we combat this? Simply maintain your insulin sensitivity via, again, exercise, diet, weight management, mm. stress control or stress management, and uh, uh, sleep, proper sleep. Can I, okay, can so I just, oh, sorry, uh, Chad, I, stress management. This one just keeps like ringing an alarm bell for me. And I kind of wanted to talk about how each of us manage stress. Um, and, 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 and we don't have to like, but yeah, how do we, each one of us, Hannah, what do you do when you feel stress accumulating? How do you manage that personally for you? Yeah, I think that's a super relevant question this year. And I think something I've this year being this COVID year, which is now more than a year. Um, <laughs> I think for me, the biggest lesson that I've learned is it's constantly changing and that's okay. What served you at one point for stress management might not serve you at another point for stress management. And so for me, I've actually been um, really listening to what my brain and my body is telling me with that stress, you know, historically it's like, okay, I feel stressed. Therefore I'm going to X, Y, or Z. Now I'm like, oh, okay. I feel stress. What is my body asking for in this stress? Is it to deload something? Is it to answer the question? Is it to find a way to actually ignore it for the time being? Um, and then, and then kind of the answer to those questions lead me down different paths. It might be journaling, it might be research, it might be, you know, going to sleep early. And so I think for me, it's really been listening to which path I need to go down to acknowledge that stress and say, Hey, I'm stressed. It's okay. Everybody's stressed. Now we will do with it with about that. Mm. How about you, Chad? Uh, what, what you, you've had a really stressful uh, year, uh, in particular yeah. the past year of moving and, and big changes and loss. And how, yeah, how, how have you managed? Hannah brought up a lot of really good specific points, everything I, I completely agree with. Uh, if I look at it from a more general perspective, it's, it's basically been what I've been trying to do over the last, geez, I'd say series of years, but now series of decades, which is just build myself into a lifestyle that suits me, you know, avoiding and building out those things that don't work for me and steering myself in as many ways as possible toward the things that, that work for me, such that I find myself in a position that anytime I'm in a hard position or a hard place, I can just look at all the good things I have going for me. I mean, just, I, I just focus on the positive to, to put it simply, but when you create all sorts of positives around you, it becomes increasingly easy to do just that. Hmm. That's a, that's a really good zoomed out view. I'm not sure I really have anything productive to add to this. I think I struggle with managing stress. Um, I, I tend to, when I have a source of stress, I just think I want to, I want to directly address and solve that and remove it. Um, but in many cases I simply can't. Right. So then that persists. And then, uh, I'm the sort of person that really struggles with feeling like I'm shirking responsibility. You know, if I'm like, well, you can't solve it right now. Uh, you need to focus on something else, or maybe you need to actually give yourself some time because I'm particularly hard on myself, right? So I'll think, uh, why the heck are you out enjoying riding your bike when you can take care of this bigger problem 
Um, and that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at though, that, that, cause you're describing that myopic view where you just get so focused on that one thing, where if you can just distract your focus from that one thing to all the other good things, it, mm-hmm. it kind of resolves itself or at least diminishes in importance. I was listening to a, a podcast a couple of weeks back that ex- was talking about stress and anxiety. And it said that it's very difficult for the brain to experience awe and anxiety at the same time. And so I think that's kind of what we're talking about is if you can be in awe or be in gratitude of something, it's difficult for your brain to also hang on to whatever the stress is. So exactly that, whether it's being in awe of what your body can do, being in awe of the mountains around you, whatever it is, I think that's a super, um, it's a real, it's very real way to handle it. It's great. Yeah. And I know I'm certainly, I'm probably not alone in this, but I'm certainly guilty of making something a bigger deal than it needs to be right. In the sense that I'll, I'll recognize that point of, or that source of stress, but then create it or make it much larger than it needs to be. Uh, that's a great point is to, to find that it's great points y'all. And sorry, once again, to interrupt Chad, but hopefully that was a, a helpful thing. Cause the training part, I think we all know how to activate that lever, right? Like the training part makes sense. Uh, we've talked so much uh, for for years now, and we will continue to talk about uh, a proper nourishment, right? And making sure that you're giving your body what it needs in that regard. Um, so I have the stress point I just wanted to cover. Appreciate uh, you taking the time for that, Chad. Thank yeah, you. It's a good tangent. I liked it. Yeah. Okay. So just to close out all the negatives of uh, insulin resistance, last thing, let's just touch on endothelial or, or basically vascular dys- dysfunction. So when our blood vessels aren't up to the task and this, this, it has to do with cardiovascular disease and what I just mentioned, hypertension. So that high blood pressure it comes about because really simply our blood vessels just don't wear well when they're under the weight of these effects of accumulation, all these things that shouldn't be in the bloodstream, stay in the bloodstream, bad stuff happens. Point is exercise. Why? Because for no other reason than the benefit to increase vascular health. I mean, if you need just one reason. How about that one? <laughs> okay. So we, we've talked about the consequences of chronically high fasting blood glucose levels, right? A lot of, lot of, lot of sugar in the blood fats in the blood. Now let's talk about the consequences or really the benefits of exercise. So the, the single most commonly recommended course of action in the face of metabolic disorders, ask any physician, they're going to steer you to exercise. It's just, it's the easy get, but it also basically covers a lot of bases. And th- there's no shortage of studies on the exercise benefits for type two diabetics. Since this is, this was mentioned earlier, I looked at five studies in particular and a meta-analysis and, and uh, review. And, and the point simply is that if exercise improves insulin sensitivity in type two diabetics, well, what's it going to do for people who are less metabolically deranged or in a better healthful, more healthful state? So some studies, you know, more uh, encouraging matters on, on, on what is really an easy topic to support in, in the literature, because it's just, it just is uh, of particular interest to us as endurance athletes is going to be one study that looked at the benefits of high intensity interval training and sprint intensity training. And, and it showed that these are widely favored, but not unanimously. It, a 2020 study also pointed out, and they looked at obese adults, but moderate intensity continuous training versus the high intensity interval training that we're so accustomed to had the same effects on insulin sensitivity. And then also the, the moderate intensity in healthy subjects, positive effect on insulin sensitivity. Another study looked at just exercise snacks is how they termed it, but just little bits of exercise throughout the day. Again, really positive effects on sensitivity to insulin. Another study looked at insulin sensitivity effects on a single bout of exercise and how they persist anywhere from two hours to more than 72 hours post. So these aren't just short-term effects. They can really carry. Insulin sensitivity can respond really quickly to exercise. And I linked to a study on that, that that particular matter where they looked at uh, athletes, they might've been untrained, trained. I don't remember, but people following 10 days, well, they were trained 10 days of detraining and they did a single bout of exercise and it restored their insulin and glucose responses to the trained level. So where they were 10 days prior, stopped training for those entire 10 days, did one bout of exercise right back on track. So it's very responsive. Uh, reduced visceral fat led to an increase in insulin sensitivity. So news to no one, visceral fat's not good for you. Get, get the weight off your, off your belly. 
Another study, increased VO2 max has a positive correlation with insulin sensitivity, but other studies showed that you, there are a lot of ways to increase your insulin sensitivity without affecting your aerobic capacity. So you, you don't have to chase improvements in insulin sensitivity via improvements of VO2 max. Exercise, yeah, I still believe that's part and parcel, but it doesn't have to mean you elevate the playing field. Mm-hmm. Um, Were these studies and, done on athletes or sedentary individuals? I'm sorry, I missed mi- that is a mixed bag. So, okay. and I link to all of these, I mean, it goes from everywhere from untrained to obese, to type two diabetics, to, um, I don't think I did any highly trained, but there were definitely trained athletes in there. Mm-hmm. When, when and I then, was in college, I had to spend some time working with a physician one morning. and when people with metabolic disorder would come in, she would obviously recommend exercise. And what she classified exercise as was 10 minutes or more with a heart rate over 100 was her general, um, wow. definition of exercise. And I, I just felt like it was relevant for this because anyone listening to the podcast, if someone said exercise, and that was the definition, we'd all probably mm-hmm. be like, wow, I can do that. That's, that's pretty easy. So yeah, yeah. It, it's just interesting. It, it's all it, relative. It is. Mm-hmm. it is. And that, and that, you know, basically points to the fact that it, it is in fact subjective and, and where you're starting from definitely reduces the demands. I mean, we do something like that. It's going to have no impact on anything. We're, we're so accustomed to it. So adapted to it, but someone who comes in, who is sedentary, who the idea of, I mean, exercises is might as well be a four letter word. They are going to hear things differently. They need to be baby stepped into the process. They need something that introduces them to the, the positive possibilities of just doing a little bit of work. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say too, Chad, that, um, so you even shared there about the athletes, you know, following 10 days of detraining, they can have, uh, changes in their insulin sensitivity levels, but it also doesn't take long for them to get back to that as well. Sure. So I, yep. we, we def, I don't want to instill a fear in anybody where you feel like I can't take time off the bike because I'm going to, you know, and it's not, it's nothing that dramatic at all. Um, not at not all, but. If, yeah. But if you are taking time off the bike, you obviously don't need to follow the same diet. You know, you're not going to be jamming sure. carbohydrate bars and sugar water and gel blocks and all those things into your system sitting on the couch. Yeah. I don't casually drink sugar water. Most of us don't, like, but I have I a mean, point coming yeah. up. Then again, what is a soda? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Right. That's what soda is. Um, but I, I don't like uh, thinking about that. Once again, let's just, because I think that athletes will have to have, all of us listen to this, we'll have to have this repeated to us constantly, many times in our heads here as we listen to this, uh, sedentary versus normal, and think about the separations that exist. You wouldn't casually sit on your couch and just eat gels and and your high carb mix, right? Like that's, yes. that's probably not what these athletes are doing. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, just keep that in mind, the separations. No, no, you- you beat me to a point that I'm very eager to make. Um, let, let me close Thank this you. out and say, yeah, th- another benefit of exercise is increased muscle capillarization. So just in- increased blood flow to the muscles. This too has been demonstrated to have an improved muscle or improved impact on muscle insulin sensitivity. Um, the point is, is that exercise can impact your insulin sensitivity in many favorable ways. So yay, exercise. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now with in mind, with, with all this in mind, Basically what we're just talking about exercise is not a free pass to eat anything without compunction. Mm-hmm. You, you do have to consider th- the duration of your exercise. I mean, we think I worked out today. I can eat whatever I want. Well, you did, but how long did you work out? How much work did you actually do? You know, maybe you did one or two hours, but the other 22 hours it does there's a lot going on in those 22 hours. There's a lot of damage that you can do a lot of hard work that you can undo. <laughs> so do consider that, that relativity. Mm -hmm. consider the frequency too. you know, how many days a week are you working out or or maybe even times a day? This does grant you a bit of a pass on some days, but those other days, obviously you're going to have to modify your eating habits to to some degree. And then the big one is intensity. This is the one that, that I always land on because you hear people like Hannah just described just, or uh, explained, they describe exercise very differently. So if you go out for a brisk or maybe even a leisurely lunch hour walk, or you hop on the bike and you do some VO2 max intervals, distinct differences, right? You know, you ask yourself, what fibers am I tapping? Am I even decrementing those fibers glycogen stores? You know, what sort of force am I putting out? Because type one fibers store less, spend less. 
So if that's all you're taxing, well, you, you obviously are going to nourish differently. Low intensity work can and should be predominantly fat fueled, but insulin inhibits lipolysis. We talked about that earlier. We've talked about that a hundred times. So hold off on the, the, the sugar water or the gel blocks. If all you're doing is, is going for a couple of walks around the block over your lunch hour. So do consider intensity. This is uh, Chad. Can I share just a couple things that have helped me with nourishment in this regard here? Um, Cause I, I've just, I've always had a very complicated relationship with food and trying to navigate that and nourishment has been like really tough. And when you like, uh, I, I felt like if I trained, then I earned something in front on the food side. And I had that relationship for quite some time. And, uh, it was, it's pretty damaging and difficult and emotionally hard because you get into these constant swings where you feel like, did I earn something now? No, I didn't. Did I earn something today? Yes, I did. And then I overindulge. Then I feel bad about it. It's, it's hard. Um, mm. We did a fantastic podcast on the Successful Athletes podcast episode with James Dunleap. I mentioned it last week where he talked about his management of binge eating disorder and still maintaining a, a, you know, the lifestyle of an endurance athlete and how he managed that. And the biggest thing that's helped me with all of that is focusing on quality and just making sure that I'm giving my body quality nutrients, a variety of nutrients. And if I make that my focus and I think of when I'm eating, instead of thinking of it as a necessary task or something that I need to take this in, so then I can do this, or because I did something active, I can do this. Instead of thinking it that way, I just think of how can I give my body more good stuff? Mm -hmm. And when I think of it that way, it's pretty hard for me to fuel poorly in the sense that like, uh, you know, I'm feeling with vegetables and fruits and, but doing so in, in moderation, because boy, it's really hard to eat, you know, a gigantic, uh, bowl full of vegetables. You'll feel amazingly full after you eat something like that. You know, um, it's pretty tough. So I've found that just focusing on quality and making sure and giving my body what it needs is a really good way to be able to manage that. Because like you said, Chad, it can get really tough if you exercise and then you have this relationship where you're like, I exercise or I ride regularly. Therefore I can eat whatever I want. And whenever I, I want. don't, yeah, whenever I want and do all that. And I don't want somebody to develop a complex around that. Right. So perhaps just shifting your focus to giving your body the highest quality that it can get, uh, mm -hmm. can be a, I, I would pose that as a healthier alternative, uh, for people to be able to make decisions that you don't feel bad about, um, later on, uh, or beforehand with nutrition. So. Yep. And I, and I completely agree. And this is a perfect segue into the take homes. So let, let's close this out, close this out with some, uh, actionable items here for, or first off, and just some ins information that you need to be insulin, information that you need to be reminded of mm. because th that was a heck of a lot of information. So first off <laughs> insulin spikes aren't harmful if you're sensitive to the effects of insulin. Okay. That, that's basically, basically true, right? If you're using the, if you're using the, the, the sugar, your insulin sensitivity is high. Everything works as it's supposed to work. Um, the, the magnitude of the impact on your insulin sensitivity definitely depends on your basal state. So if you're coming into this whole process healthy versus someone who's overweight or obese, if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, obviously it's going to be a different road for you. Um, high blood sugar becomes a concern when it's chronically elevated. So these acute changes or the spikes that you, that you term them, Seamus, are, 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 it's normal blood sugar insulin response. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sustained elevation, however, or slow returns to baseline, these can be problematic. These could be causes for concern. And then uh, point four, emphasize the environmental aspects of good metabolic health, it, namely exercise and diet and the weight control that we've talked about numerous times already. And when you hear metabolic health, don't, don't just reduce it to, oh, metabolic health, that only applies to athletes. No, metabolic health. We're talking about the health of your cells. The cells make up your entire body. So we're talking about health in a general sense. Um, but, but all of this, to, to really put it another way, just shame is keep doing the things you're probably already doing as an endurance athlete. You're, you're on the right path. And personally, with regards to insulin resistance, I say target exercise above all. Because so often exercise is the best medicine, but here it actually drives the other highly controllable factors. As Jonathan just mentioned, high quality foods become part of the picture. They become increasingly necessary as you ask more and more of yourself in terms of performance. And then weight control 
is more easily achieved when you, when you couple an appropriate diet with proper exercise, it just kind of happens. So man, start with exercise. And then finally, with regards to insulin sensitivity <laughs> regarding exercise, don't overthink the dose, just do something and do it often. Mm. Yeah. Great, great advice, Chad. Hannah, do you have any, um, we're, we're going to talk about meal timing in the next one and kind of taking a lot of this information and giving it a lot of application, but do you have anything else that you'd want to add before we move on to Brittany's question? I think Chad did a great job. Cool. I don't, I don't have a lot to add now. Awesome. Thanks for diving down that chat. I know that, that also has a lot of personal relevance for you as well. So I appreciate mm -hmm. you going through that to, to help, um, our audience. Um, yeah, absolutely. If you have questions about this, I see a lot of you on YouTube, uh, right now in the live chat, which you can join us by the way, every Thursday, 8 AM Pacific, uh, is usually when we're live as we are this time. And you can join the live chat and chat with lots of folks on there. And lots of people are finding this, uh, insight very helpful. So Seamus, Thank you for the asking the question that you were afraid mm -hmm. to ask because a lot of people had the same question. Chad learned throughout this even, and I'm sure everybody across the whole spectrum has learned throughout this. And then also a lot of people talking about uh, the tips that they've found to be able to manage uh, their health, which is uh, their, their relationship with nutrition and everything else, which is fantastic. So, okay. Brittany's question. She says, Hey coaches love the podcast. And I imagine all of you being in my corner when I train, I hope that's not too weird, but all of you are my ideal coaches and I get to use each of your unique advice at different times. It's the super team. Uh, that's cool. Brittany. Uh, we're happy to, we're happy to be there for you. I'm a data analyst that rev that revels in specificity and has a hard time with general guidelines. And she says, maybe this is why I was drawn to cycling. Uh, she says, I train early before work and have solved the early morning workout fueling challenge by just taking in a banana and water right when I get up, then taking in carbs throughout the workout. This has really helped, but every single morning, I still find myself wondering what is the exact ideal time to eat? In other words, when do I eat so that when I start training, my blood sugar level is on the way up and I peak during my first set. And how do I avoid dreaded, the dreaded insulin depleting or dreaded insulin depleting my blood glucose levels right when I need them most? Uh, she says, I know there's likely a level of individual variance here, but how specific can you get or how specific is the research? Well, we just covered the insulin part there when we're talking about being in an active state versus an inactive state, right? Um, insulin responds, um, but when you're in that active state, it doesn't play that role. Like Chad said, our body's really good at just making sure that energy goes straight from the bloodstream into where it needs to be at those muscles. So, um, so that's one thing to keep in mind, uh, if you're active, um, that said, we, we have, uh, get another visual and, and, and forgive me that this is, this is a very broad stroke here. This isn't meant to be anything that's, uh, uh, measured or specifically, um, scaled anything else like that, but these are just graphs that can hopefully imply the relationship of insulin and blood glucose, but visualize them. And, and, and once again, this is implied, this is not measured or precise in any way. Um, but when you're in a sedentary state and your blood sugar goes up, uh, then your body, like Chad just said, sends the insulin soldiers to the rescue and they go out there and they end up managing that level, right? What managing that level looks like is a decrease in blood glucose levels. That's what happens. And then it will stabilize thereafter. Uh, insulin production will drop off. And then as a result, uh, also your blood sugar will just stabilize at what should be a healthy rate. That's how it works, right? So that's in your active or in your sedentary state, that's what goes on. And that's pretty easy to understand, hopefully, after we've gone through everything we've gone through there. But in an active state, it does change. And particularly looking at the context of your question here, Brittany, uh, we can see that there is a change in how our body does this. So first of all, when you start training, um, it, it really does have a profound effect on what you do. Uh, suddenly you start training and your muscles say, Hey, I got big demand over here. Can you please send me all of that blood glucose? And it will drop quickly because your body is taking it and using it. Uh, so then your body either responds by liberating more of that from the liver and from other sources that it has, or you start taking it in. And then as you take it in, it's able to be ready, readily available and be used. Um, even increases in intensity will drop that right. Uh, or, or extensive durations at the same fueling rate. Um, if you end up dropping on that, uh, fueling rate, or you just reach a point of diminishing returns or your body becomes less efficient, it might end up taking in more. So that's kind of the relationship that you have when you're active blood sugar demand is high. 
Um, and when you're talking about just getting on the bike, uh, absolutely that's the case. So hopefully those visuals that you're seeing on screen, and if you're listening to this on the podcast, head over to YouTube, you can find this episode. It's episode 327. You can see those. Um, so that's kind of like what happens and outlining that activity level goes up, blood sugar goes down, take in more and you can stabilize. That's just what happens. So Hannah, how about we talk about the context? Um, like specifically like the things that you would suggest or give her advice on, on talking about finding that exact, and I'm using air quotes here, that exact <laughs> ideal time to eat. Yeah. I think first, it's really important to address the fact that whenever we talk about food, we always have to be really careful because food, food is a sensitive subject. Um, and if you don't think so, then maybe you're one of the lucky people, but you should be sensitive to other people's sensitivity. So just want to put that out there. Also, you know, I'm not a nutritionist. And so, especially in school, that was something that getting our degree, we were, it was always pushed into our head is you are not a nutritionist. You can advise, you cannot dictate. And so yeah. that's exactly what we're trying to do here. We're trying to advise, or at least what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to advise with scientific evidence to back it up, but not trying to tell you this is what you must do. Um, mm. But I also really relate to what you're saying is you like specific uh, guidelines and have trouble with general guidelines. So I want to try and be as specific as possible. Um, and that's, you know, strictly from a textbook definition, what they say in regards to this is you should either um, eat within 15 minutes of starting your workout, or you should eat more than 45 minutes before starting your workout. And the reason for this is because of what Jonathan just outlined. So when you eat within 15 minutes of starting your workout, it's so close to that beginning of the workout that whatever that food is going to do will change by the workout, no matter what. So when you start your workout, um, you know, your body's going to say, okay, we're using this, it's going to decline. And then hopefully your body, you'll either give it something or your body will mobilize, um, uh, mobilize for energy, mobilize the stores for energy, and it'll start to rise again. So you'll see that no matter what, if you eat more than 45 minutes before, same thing, you'll get that, you'll, you'll have that spike decline and then start to stabilize again. And then you'll start the workout. What you want to avoid is that range between 15 and 45. And the reason for that is because that's where that decline is going to be. That's where you're going to feel kind of lethargic. And so if you hit that point, not to say that you can't train or that it won't be a good experience, but it might just be a little bit harder um, in general, just a little bit harder, and also harder mentally, because you might have that food and then be like, oh, why would I train now? And that could just simply be a result of what your blood sugar is doing. So for your specific guidelines, I think that's a really great place to start. Um, but that said, gosh, like it is really hard. And, and you said that you like to train in the morning. And this is something that I can relate to a lot because now as a, prof I've seen both sides of it now as a professional athlete, I can train any time of day, whenever I want. And it's actually my job to time my nutrition around that. And so that's something that I think about every day. Okay. I'm going to eat this time. I'm going to train this time. And I get to make it as perfect as possible. When I was in college, I was on the bike before 6 a.m. almost every single day. And I remember professional athletes, you know, the, that cohort saying, so if you're on the bike at 5.45, does that mean you're waking up at 3.45 to eat? And it's just <laughs> like, I mean, what do you think? No, <laughs> please don't do that. It's unnecessary. You know, and that's where perfection just, it, it might perfection mm -hmm. might not be the goal. You know, the goal is to do the best with what you have. And so that's where, once again, this rule, this guideline rule, whatever you want to call it can be helpful is, you know, if you're going to wake up, you know, 45 minutes before, maybe you do eat right away. If you're one of those people that you have your kit laid out and you're going to roll out of bed, throw the chamois on, get straight on the bike, it's within 15 minutes and what you eat in that time frame will also, or when you're eating could also dictate what you're eating. You know, if you're eating two hours before we might be eating those pancakes and that's perfect. And what a joyous experience. If you're eating 15 minutes before, it might be that banana and water. So 
it's just playing with these guidelines and figuring out what works for you, what works for your body and also what works for your lifestyle. Mm. Yeah. Great, great advice on that. And probably answering a lot of questions proactively that athletes have about fueling early morning workouts <laughs> and getting up crazy early to do so. Uh, Chad, what, what do you have any thoughts to share on this one? The kind of the, the concept of timing it and everything. I, I do. I just kind of want to shine a light on the inherent complexities of trying to be exact. Cause it's, it's like mm. chasing perfection, trying to be hyper-specific. It's a, it's a tall order. So I mentioned Jake Kushner earlier, the, the pediatric endocrinologist, and he uh, was in a podcast with Peter Atia. I listened to a while back, super informative, but the couple of things he mentioned that I jotted down. First off, there are some 40 factors that can influence blood glucose. So, th so th I mean, it, it's being affected from a number of different angles. For example, different food compositions. So you, the comparison between, you can talk about carbohydrate, but starch versus refined carbohydrate. Tremendous difference in how it impacts your, your blood glucose, or your insulin release. Ground beef versus steak. I mean, something as, as simple as just a change in the, what I, what I term format. Uh, Omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids versus saturated fats. Again, different impacts on blood glucose, insulin delivery, or insulin release. So this is kind of a matter of quality, but also, again, format. <clears throat> Additionally, a uh, different intake order. So if you chase a salad with pasta versus chasing pasta with meat, different things happen. It, it's different rates of energy release. And the reason being is that these different macronutrients have different rates of gastric emptying. So if they empty at a slower or quicker rate, they make it into your bloodstream at a slower or quicker rate. And then all of these things are potentially variable between individuals. This is probably not news to anybody, but if you, if you look at the insulin index or the glycemic index, or you look at the, uh, the, the glycemic load, whatever, if you look at how this should impact you, how it impacts you can vary drastically from how it impacts another person. I mean, I always talk about like white bread being the, the more bio, uh, bioenergetically available than table sugar. Not for everybody. It, it doesn't hold true. Some people just don't see the same effect. And then it's potentially variable within the same individual. And this is what I found really interesting is that an identical food can have different insulin response. And this comes back to other variables, stress, sleep, exercise. And there are a lot of things that can impact how that same food interacts with your, your intestinal system or in your, in your metabolic system. So all of this basically steers me and any data scientist or data analyst back to continue, continuous glucose monitoring. So CGMs, I mean, if you want to get hyper-specific, you can't have snapshots. You have to have continual feedback. You have to be able to observe trends. You have to be able to see how one thing affects you and you alone, and then build a database. It, it, it's, a, it's a ton of work. And, and frankly, I think in a lot of cases, it's unmerited. Um, it, it, sh it could be tremendously beneficial. And I do recognize that there, I do recognize that there are definitely use cases, um, athletes, uh, endurance athletes competing with type one competing who have type one diabetes. Absolutely. You have to very closely manage your, your blood glucose at, at all times. Um, people on, on professional teams, I mean, we're trying to find chinks in armor, right? They're trying to find the little things that they can improve. Well, maybe CGM can lead them to new insights. Absolutely. I think for most of us, it's a bit excessive, interesting, absolutely useful, very probably necessary. Absolutely not. But I'm, I'm super keen on it myself. Yeah. If I could share an anecdote in that regard of my experience with using CGM or continual glucose monitor and looking at everything from a training perspective and everything else, uh, it's really hard. Like you said, Chad, it's really, really complex. And, um, even from one day to the next, if you eat the same thing, which I have done, I've like same exact food, tried to time it the same, but life inherently inserts variables of different levels of stress or activity or anything else. You, you might still like it, 16 minutes, trying to pinpoint it at 16 minutes and 30 seconds of the exact time to do it. Uh, you're more looking at like, okay, is it within a half hour? Hopefully, like, <laughs> how can I pin this down? I really like that window that you shared there, um, or those two windows of 15 and 45 and kind of shooting for that because it's really complex. And like you said, layering is different. So when I, um, and, and first of all, too, I think that there could be, you know, it's, 
it can be difficult to manage your relationship, a healthy relationship with food with CGM, uh, continual glucose monitoring, because that could cause you to read into the data more than what needs to be read into and, and a whole lot of uh, stuff. But, you know, when blood sugar goes up uh, and then it comes down as insulin responds and then it stabilizes or when you're in an active state, it changes. All that stuff can be really interesting, but I can validate what Chad has said personally in saying that the order of the food that you eat matters. Uh, I can also validate the difference between things like white and brown rice, white rice. I see a much more rapid uptake in blood glucose levels, and then kind of like an equal and opposite insulin response usually is what exists to everything that I take in. It's so it seems. Um, and if I take in something like brown rice, it's much more gradual and the drop-off is also more gradual. Uh, if I take in more fructose, uh, it tends to see, actually strangely seem like things are more sustainable. If I take in more glucose in proportion, it tends to spike more. Um, so there's lots of things that I've like figured out by that, but it certainly hasn't made it so that in this case, Brittany, I feel like 16 minutes and 32 seconds is my magic time. Um, what it has done is just prompted me to follow the advice of Hannah where I'm like, Oh, okay. My workout's coming up. I should take something in 15 minutes beforehand. Uh, that's, that's a good thing to do. And then when I get on the bike, it's just reminded me to take my own advice more, which is make sure you're fueling constantly. You know, um, it's not like, uh, it's, it's not like it's opened this, this, this vaulted door where I've been, you know, waiting to find out all the information behind it. It's just basically like, Hey, all the general advice that you hear from folks that are science-based, it turns out it's really good. You should follow it. So um, that's kind of my experience with it. It's been interesting to measure it and to see, uh, see what I've learned from it. Um, but Hannah, this is also somewhat dependent too, right? I mean, for cycling, it's pretty easy to take in I mean, for some folks like Nate, I feel like Nate could eat like a meat lovers pizza on the bike and be okay. Um, but on site in cycling, it's a bit easier than like multi-sport stuff. And you have a history in try how is it, how have you found meal timing or just taking in food differently, depending on that? Yeah, I think um, this is such a funny subject. When I thought about bringing this up, I was like, yeah, of course we need to normalize this. And now that we're on this huge podcast, I'm like, oh gosh, we're really going to talk about this. <laughs> but I, I, think that, uh, I think that it's really important to talk about because at least for me, you know, I spent 10 years racing triathlon and then I switched to cycling. And um, that transition, I feel like, was easy because all of a sudden, you know, I, I had, it, I felt like nutrition for triathlon had to be, um, a little bit more delicate. And then as I transitioned to cycling, I discovered more and more things that my body could actually handle while on the bike. And so for me with cycling, I feel like I have a, a big array of foods that I know sit pretty well with me. And, and that variety is great. And if I do have a stomach issue, it's probably just going to be, oh, my stomach hurts. And mm. if it's a training day and not a race, that's something that's just mental note. We can move on. We can push through this, whatever I need to do for triathlon. It was a little bit different and a little bit more of a bummer, especially, you know, swimming, same <laughs> thing, maybe just some stomach cramps, something like that. Personally running is tough. And I think yeah. it needs to be normalized because no one ever wants to bring it up. But when I bring it up in my close circle of friends, everyone's like, Oh my gosh, me too. So I can only assume that if we talk about this on this podcast, everyone listening is probably gonna be like, yes, if you have stomach distress running, it might be a side stitch. It might be a cramp. It might be stopping at the porta potty every mile. And it is not fun. It is not fun. So for me, I just think it's important to talk about those differences. For me running, I can't take in very much at all. So for me running, it was always two hours. It was always more than 45 minutes. Realistically, I probably needed two hours in order to eat something and then go running. If I ate something in that 15 minute time frame before starting the run, I needed to make sure that my run went back by some sort of restroom or something after the warm up. So 
I think it's important to talk about. I'd be curious if anyone else here wants yeah. to back me up. So I'm not just totally talking about that, <laughs> but I, I think it's really important to talk about because we had talked about all of these variables and same thing variables with sport, your body responds differently. When you run, there's a gravitational force. I, at least what I picture it's pulling everything down and, and you can feel it when you're out there. No doubt. I, it's common Chad, you've raced duathlon and I haven't, I haven't done anything like that. So I can just uh, comment on what I've observed from other athletes experiences, but not my own. Is there a question in there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you experienced this Chad, but stomach sure. stress, particularly unique to running versus cycling. hundred percent. It, it, running, I mean, there's just jostling. I mean, you're working against gravity. There's a whole lot of movement going on. Whereas you're on the bike, I mean, maybe mountain biking, maybe you can get kind of rough and bounce things around a bit, but even then it's just, it's just not the same Running's just, it's just hard. And then you put a bunch of stuff on your gut and try to run. It's, it's near impossible. I mean, I found that I, I regret it, but I can eat close to a ride and still get through the ride. I can even do a, a reasonably hard bike workout having eaten pretty recently. Mm -hmm. I can't do those things running and, and maybe I could, maybe I could struggle through it, but it would be a real struggle far more than it is on the bike. And I don't even want to think about swimming. That just seems like way too much work to be doing and too little air <laughs> coming in. I mean, there's just so many challenges already with swimming. I don't want to introduce that one also. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. Swimming, man. Um, on the, but this is why they have a lot of porta potties at every aid station in an Ironman, right? It's not, and, and, and it's not because you're the only one suffering from it. And they're, they've got 17 porta potties for you to choose from. It's because everybody <laughs> goes through that at Ironman world championships, right? Chad, when we've been there and we've been watching it, folks are going in and out of those at the world championship level. These are really high performing athletes and it's common for them to experience this. I shouldn't say common, but it's not, it's not uncommon for them to go through a situation where they experience it. It happens. Um, so it's, it's something that, uh, absolutely needs to be taken into consideration also kind of to along these lines that it takes training. It kind of takes time to get to the point where you can, uh, take in food reliably or, or comfortably, uh, whether that's training your gut or whether who knows what, you know, what the main cause is for you individually, but lots of things need to happen to get to the point where it's easier. So, um, should we jump into some rapid fire stuff? Let's do it. Uh, you can check out, go to trainer road on Instagram and you can see there where we asked for the rapid fire questions this week. In my opinion, we received nowhere near enough ridiculous questions. We need more ridiculous questions. Um, just the same. We'll, we'll start one off with a great one from Ben. He says, George, while riding yay or nay, <laughs> Chad, you have to start us off. Heck yes. Did you, did you see Ryan Sandish? Come on, man. <laughs> Anybody can tell amazing. him. <laughs> that was amazing. For those that don't know, Ryan Standish raced the snowshoe world cup short track with no intention of racing the XCO in jorts, but he raced at the short track racing in hand up has some jorts that I think are like particularly made for cycling. And he took over the entire race. Like he was a superhero of that race. People didn't even care about the winners. They were just chanting jorts and he wheelied across the line in jorts and it was amazing. So we, uh, should we clarify what jorts are. Yeah. Yeah. Jean shorts. Yeah. Cut off jean shorts, which is <laughs> Jorts tend to be cut off jean shorts. So yeah. And they're, they're very short too. <laughs> it was a whole thing, but kudos to Ryan. If anybody wants to follow him on Instagram, you should, he's actually a trainer road employee too. Uh, thanks for all your work here at trainer road, Ryan, a uh, pro mountain biker. And he also does a fundraiser for bike MS every year, which really, um, uh, is something that's close to home for him, for his father who, who battles that every day. Uh, so just a fantastic person to follow. Ryan Standwich is how you can find him on Instagram. And we'll, we'll link down below in the description. He's a, a great follow. Okay. Uh, and yeah, I, I agree, especially if they're stretchy, if they're not stretchy, I don't know how you could. Um, hmm. I don't know if Ryan ran a chamois underneath them for the short track. That's a question you should all ask him on Instagram. <laughs> so <laughs> not sure there was much room. Um, okay. Next one, Hannah, what can I do to support my nine-year-old daughter? Who's interested in racing? This is a great question. And I actually started racing when I was nine. Um, so from my perspective, having started racing, then looking at what my mom did was, I think it's just making it accessible to her. Um, so not pushing her, but making it accessible to her. And that's what I feel like my mom always did. And what my parents always did is, you know, there was absolutely no pressure. If you want to do it, we're here 
to take you to the practices. If not, you know, doesn't change anything. And so I say, um, driving her to where she needs to be, um, giving her people to ride with, because as a nine-year-old, that can be challenging. It's not that easy to go out on your own, um, making it fun. So allowing her to have friends, uh, that do it, finding her a group to do it with. Um, and then, you know, letting her, letting her decide when to ride and when to race. And one of the ways I think you can kind of differentiate pushing her to do that since you have to supply the access versus having her do it is letting her know that there's an opportunity to ride, asking her whether or not she wants to do it, and then see if she brings it up one more time. And mm. if she brings it up that extra time, she really wants to be there. So, hey, do you want to do this race? It's, you know, two Saturdays from now. Yes, I do. If she brings it up one more time after that conversation, boom, she really wants to do it. And that's so exciting. And I think that's a great way um, to make sure that it's really her goal. And then you just get to support her in that. And that's really fun. That's great advice, Hannah. <clears throat> Fantastic. From a parent expressing that to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, next one. How bad is it for mountain bike tires to be used uh, on long rides over the winter? I can personally answer this one, Hannah. I don't know if you ride your mountain bike on the road a lot. I do. Um, so, uh, yeah, they wear down. Um, but in my mind, it, I, I kind of get excited about that because then it means they're faster because there's less knob rubbing against the ground. So like I have a few, if I ever end up doing Leadville again, I have a few Aspens that are kind of like worn down to almost be buttery smooth in the middle. And I'm like, man, that would be a fast tire. Um, probably a little bit sketchy, but yeah, it does wear them down. If I'm doing like, if I do 500 miles on the road of interval training, so there's granted like a good amount of like, you know, acceleration within that and braking as well as I'll turn around or something, but if I do 500 miles on a Maxxis Aspen, that means the dips and the knobs go away and it's, and it's just the knobs are flat on top. And if I get up to a thousand miles, then the knobs are at risk of disappearing. Basically, personally, that's what I've had. Hannah, I don't know if you'd have anything else to share. Yeah. I mean, I think that explains it numerically really well. I would just say, I mean, if you're worried about the tire wearing down, then yeah, it, it wears it down. But in general, I love to ride my mountain bike on the road. It's just more sport specificity. So I say mm -hmm. do it, even if it wears down a little bit. For sure. And also like when a car is coming and my radar tells me a car is coming, I'm very comfortable on my mountain bike, just going into the shoulder for a bit. Whereas on my road bike, I'm not. And that's like another, I'm very, uh, riding on the road is just more and more challenging for me mentally and emotionally over the time, just of losing friends and everything else. And, um, that's a big help for me yeah. to know that I have that avenue of, no, I can just go onto the shoulder. It's fine. I can go into the dirt. It's no issue. And I think if you're doing sprint workouts too, having your hands wide versus in the drops, it does make a difference. So it's important mm -hmm. to practice, yeah. uh, in that positioning as well. Good pro tips, Hannah. Um, this one, I, I, I added to it because we have Hannah with us and it wouldn't really be fair to ask this one, but, uh, Michael says, would you rather be Ghana being Filippo Ghana, Pogacar, Richie Rude, Nino Scherter, or Greg Menar? Chad, who would you pick? All these, Greg. I mean, I'm not sure if they're, they're not all world champions, but they're basically world champions. I mean, Pogacar is basically there. Yeah. <laughs> it'd be, it'd be fun to be any one of them for a day or a season, but uh, Greg Menar, just because he is the perfect expression of longevity. Yeah. Super impressive athlete, right? Um, I would pick Nino Scherter because he's also a helicopter pilot and helicopters are the coolest things in the world. Um, Hand, now I made this one up for Hannah now as well. I said, who would you rather be Ellen Van Dyke, Mariana Voss, Isabeau Cordorier, Evie Richards, or Miriam Nicole, which is analogous to each one of those world champions or experts in those fields, just in the same fields, but on the, on the women's side, who'd you pick Hannah? Um, it's such a hard question. I mean, I think just for the sake of rapid fire, I'll say Evie Richards. Cause look where she is right now. She's young. Like, I feel like I can relate to that. So she true truly is like, Oh man, like if there ever was, I wish I was her. I wish yeah. I was her. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. 
That's exactly where I'm coming from. And, or not exactly, but definitely Evie Richards, because I think she has just now had her eyes open to how very good she is. And that's got to yeah. be a really fun place to be. I mean, mm -hmm. she's she's recognizing ridiculous potential. Mm -hmm. That's a really good way to put it. I do feel like, because you see that almost surprise after every race and she's like, I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's really fun to watch. What an incredible athlete. Uh, Keegan, I think we know who, who this is. He says, has Nate's toe arrived yet? If so, how does he like it? For those that don't know what a towie is, it's a bungee strap that you hook on your bike and then you tow your child up a hill. <laughs> so he's commenting about see where this Sophia, is going. <laughs> Sophia towing Nate up hills. It's uh, Cape Epic, <laughs> which is hilarious. So um, I, I already think Nate is bringing like an entire bike in spare parts, basically. And I think that he wants Sophia to carry all those spare parts when they're out there, just in case something happens in the field. So Sophia is already going to like weigh as much as Nate with just carrying Nate's spares and nutrition because he drinks and eats so much too. So, um, next week we'll be talking with Nate to see how his prep has been going. And I am, I am going to hold him to the coals here and I'm going to ask him the tough questions. So everybody, it's going to be a fiery episode. It'll be good. Tune in next week. Caleb says in a cyclocross race, would you rather have a good call up on a mountain bike or a bad call up on a CX bike? Uh, I take the CX I mean, bike. Yeah. 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 Racing cross on a mountain bike is not very, I mean, it's fine. It's totally fine. Anybody can do it, but it's, uh, it's frustrating if you're really trying to compete, uh, when you're racing toward the top there. This question I hear is, would you rather have a good first five minutes and then a bad 55 minutes? Or would you rather have a bad first five minutes? <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Eric says is an, is an IF or intensity factor of 0.9 over the course of a three and a half hour, three and a half hour mountain bike marathon race, an indicator of too low of an FTP. Uh, Hannah, you want to answer this one? Yeah, I think, um, IF being intensity factor, I think if you're going off of heart rate, then no, it doesn't mean that you need to change your heart rate because likely what's happening is your intensity is changing a lot. Your heart rate monitor just can't detect those things quick enough. And so if that's by heart rate, I'm not surprised at all. If it's by power, then yes, probably because 0.9 over the course of three and a half hours would be incredibly difficult anyway, not to mention with mountain biking. The only thing to note with mountain biking is you also want to look at uh, the VI or variability index, because with mountain biking, you're looking at a lot of really, really high powers and then lower powers. And so there will be sometimes in some courses or some efforts where it's just so big of peaks and valleys that you can end up with some really interesting wattages. Um, yeah. A lot of the time it ends up being lower, I think on the yeah. mountain bike, uh, like you might finish a race and think, great, I rode tempo, you know, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't, it doesn't really mean, it doesn't really mean yeah. a lot. Um, and so I think the rapid mm -hmm. fire answer to this question is yes, if it's by power. Mm -hmm. Bobby bike carrier of choice, roof rack, hitch rack, or in car. If you have the space in car always for me, just cause it's safer. Um, but the ease of a hitch rack, like a Kuat or a one up that you just, you don't have to take anything off or don't have to mount it on your frame. You just clamp the wheels oh, that you can't beat that convenience. That's my thought. Kuat Sherpa is the one I use. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other differing thoughts or move on to the next one? That's, that's exactly where I'm coming from. Yeah. Cool. I agree. Awesome. Alistair says, love trainer road. Thanks for the whole team for an excellent product and, uh, and great support content or supporting content like this podcast. My question relates to the ramp test. Does it measure your muscular limit or your aerobic limit, or do those end up being the same thing? How does it connect to the 20 minute test uh, in terms of what physical limits it's measuring? So I wanted to throw this one in rapid fire to intentionally answer it in such a fashion. Cause I don't think that we have to go too deep on this one. Right, Chad? No. Yeah, exactly. Do you, do you want me to take it? Or do you if you want to, yep, sure. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're not looking to measure your muscular limit. You will get pushed to your muscular limit if you truly go all in, which you should on a ramp test, but we're looking for an estimate of your aerobic limit. And we just do it through a different means than the 20 minute test. The 20 minute test is kind of a get to the aerobic limit and stay there. And, and you know, we'll reduce it a little bit because there'll be a little bit of anaerobic contribution. Whereas with the ramp test, it's get to your aerobic limit push well past it and completely deplete your anaerobic resources. And then we'll calculate your aerobic limit based on that. Yep. 
general. The way to go, Chad, 10 out of 10. Ramon says, is it important to stretch before riding? How about after riding? Hannah, you want to take that one? Please do not static stretch before riding. I think this <laughs> is a really old concept that a lot of people still love to hang on to because it makes them feel like they're doing something good before riding, <laughs> but static stretching, meaning you're holding a pose for an extended period of time, like touching your toes for 10 seconds or 30 seconds before riding, it's been shown to decrease muscular endurance and decrease power. So it is not helping you. Um, if you want to do something before riding, you should do either dynamic stretching, which is essentially the goal is to increase blood flow. So leg swings, um, things like that. And, and that's great because you want to have blood flow to your tendons and muscles and things like that, or you should do some activations, which, um, I think the word activation sounds so fancy, but you know, really what we're talking about is um, activating muscles that are either sensitive or maybe not activated that well while riding. And so we need to, to tell them, Hey, it's time to work. So I recommend clamshells for the glute meds, monster walks for the glute meds, quad sets. If you have any sort of quadricep tendonitis or something like that, that you're dealing with, um, and bird dogs for anyone with low back pain. And then stretching is great after riding. Um, I think the main goal of stretching is to increase your mobility. And so if you have any mobility limitations or anything, you know, if your hamstrings are really tight or your hip flexors are really tight, yes, that can contribute to injuries and pain. So yes, you want to stretch those things out. And then also, especially after riding, stretching is a great way to activate, um, the parasympathetic nervous system. So getting into that rest and digest state. Mm -hmm. We have an article that you can find on the blog as well, <clears throat> forgive me, called Stretches for Cyclists, Five Stretches You Should Know. And some of them are included within there that uh, uh, or the stretches are in there. Then we also have articles on activation because that activation side is super important. If you do have like a, some sort of impingement or injury that's due to like imbalance or some sort of range of motion issue, and you're working on that with PT, it can be great to do mobility exercises before. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, that's less stretching and more about, um, regaining control over like a larger range of motion within a joint, right. Um, or, or doing something along those lines. So yeah, great advice. Okay. Uh, psychologically, I can't see myself staying sane with an indoor only training training plan, even if the winter fast approaching in the Hudson Valley in New York, where I ride. So question one, this is for Matt. What's the best way to use train road to balance weekday indoor sessions, but still get out on the road for a few hours on both Saturday and Sunday on my days off. Matt, two things. Number one, outside workouts exist. Don't make training a drudgery, uh, right? You can train inside or outside wherever you want. Um, all you have to do is go into your calendar and hit outside, and then your workout will become an outside workout and send right to your head unit. Super easy. Um, number two, do a mid volume or low volume plan where you have your structure, where you get it in, in the week and then get it on the weekends. That's the best way to do it because then that gives you the flexibility for life be, to be able to intervene and still not throw your training off. And then you get to do all the fun stuff with your friends. And then his question too, are you hiring? Uh, we're, I think we're more or less kind of always hiring for different positions. You can check it out at trainerroad.com slash jobs. There's an RSS you can subscribe to, to get updated on that. Ryan says, is riding a hardtail mountain bike at gravel races, such as BWR, a reasonable option, or will I be so disadvantageous to the point where it wouldn't be competitive? This has you written all over it, Hannah. You race BWR San Diego this year. Yeah, I think it strongly depends on the gravel race. So the answer to this question is you need to do some serious research on the specific gravel race before you commit to that. Um, and two perfect examples are Sophia won the Crusher and Tusher, this year on a mountain bike. So clearly mountain bikes can work for some gravel events that said specifically for BWR, um, I raced a road bike there. And so that would be one where I, I don't think that you would be competitive on the mountain bike because there's so many road sections. So mm. if you're thinking about using a road bike or a mountain bike, instead of a gravel bike for a gravel race, you just need to be really sure with a a lot of research and especially in the gravel community, a lot of the time that research could just be a Facebook page or a forum dedicated to that race. Cause most people are really excited about sharing that insight. For sure. Great points. And last, Hannah, what tires, oh, sorry, Chad, go ahead really quick. What tires did you use on your road bike at BWR? Hmm. Um, 
I did you go full road or did you go high volume and you tread? I used a really low profile tread of a tire that I will not name, but Katarina <laughs> won it on a high road, a Maxis high road. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Barrick says favorite fall beverage of choice. Chad, this one has you written all over it to lead us here. This doesn't have to be alcoholic. It could be anything. Oh, well, this, this be <laughs> it can also be alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. should state. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, colder months mean Imperial stouts and Imperial porters. And then, mm. you know, bourbons forever on the list. It's, it's a uh, multi-seasonal. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Hannah, how about you? What's your favorite drink? Um, fall so drink. Since I'm really happy that Chad went down the alcoholic route, I'm going to say, um, I make this really good. It's called apple pie moonshine. Ooh, mm. Chad's going to be requesting a bottle. <laughs> the, the look that he just gave. Yeah. 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 Is it, is it yeah. high booze or high sweetness? It's apple cider, apple juice, and Everclear. Oh, whoa. <laughs> 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 yeah. <Whoa. laughs> awesome. I would say that my, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't drink pumpkin spice lattes. That's a very fall drink. I don't drink alcohol. Bubble water doesn't, hasn't really jumped on the seasonal train yet. So <laughs> I'm pretty boring. I guess hot cider. I don't know. Um, let's get into some listener questions. There's also some great live questions that have to do with, um, <clears throat> Uh, what we talked about in the beginning, kind of like fueling and points of diminishing returns. You've submitted them. They're awesome. We're going to get to them. Um, we're just going to answer a couple of questions that people have submitted at trainerroad.com slash podcast, just like the deep dive questions. You can do that every week and please do it. Whatever question you have, go to trainerroad.com slash podcast and submit it. Chelsea submitted. Hi, Trainer Road team. I discovered your podcast a few months ago and it helped me get excited about riding again after a long hiatus from exercise during the pandemic. Up until now, my focus has been triathlon and road cycling, but the podcast has opened my eyes to the many styles of mountain biking out there. And I recently demoed a mountain bike and it was the most fun I've ever had on a bike. I feel that Ooh. Chelsea. Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> uh, my question is this, what advice do you have for someone buying their first mountain bike? In the long run, I'm interested in getting into cross country racing, but I'm also interested in a bike that is pretty cushy on downhills. So would you recommend getting a full suspension bike with not much travel, like the Epic Evo she, she mentions, or in your case, you have the Trek top fuel, right? That you would ride, uh, in this case, Hannah, or something a little bit more cushy, like a stump jumper, or in this case, I believe that would be the Trek remedy uh, is a similar mm -hmm. bike to the, what they mm -hmm. have there. Um, trying to balance enough suspension to keep me comfy with efficiency. Uh, thank you for your help. What would you suggest to Chelsea in this case, Hannah? Yeah, I think. Um, what we're talking about here is basically, you know, 110, 120 travel bike versus more like a 130. But you also have to think about the fact that the geometry of those bikes are different, um, more slacked yeah. out for the greater suspension one. And so personally, for anyone buying their first mountain bike, um, more of a beginner, I recommend 100 to 120 millimeters of travel. Um, and I think that's a key. I think that that's the right move because you want to be able to pedal the bike really well. And yes, all, all of these bikes that we're talking about, they all pedal great. And I'm sure, um, with a road bike background and a triathlon background, I'm sure you're really strong, but what you're going to notice is the difference in efficiency. And that can be really frustrating for someone new to mountain biking because you can't really, it's difficult to differentiate am I slow? Is my bike slow? Is the trail slow? And so create, getting a bike with really good efficiency is going to make you feel good and make you feel fast and going fast is fun. Um, mm -hmm. if you have a bike that's heavier, more slacked out, it's also going to handle differently and it can, um, yeah, it's cushy and it's fun, but it can also be difficult to maneuver, uh, especially mm -hmm. as a, I think, especially as a female, um, I, I can't speak from the male perspective, but it takes more upper body. And if you're not used to that, it can be a, a greater leap to make, especially for things like it's harder to lift up the front end and that's going uphill or even coming off of drops, you know, getting back enough to keep that front end up. Um, and then also, I think if you're newer to, to riding, you probably don't need more than hundred millimeters. It might feel good, but you're probably not doing a trail that is going to max out those hundred millimeters or 120, either one. It's so mm -hmm. similar. Um, and 
and so I just think it's, it's better to take the time with that, that XC shorter travel bike to make sure you're using everything you have than just getting more. And so, yeah, you're probably not going to ride something that needs more and you're probably not going to use it all because you're not going to be so used to setting up, you know, how much PSI you want in your fork <laughs> and your shock. And so spend some extra time at the bike shop with friends or even just on your own playing with those things and really work on using it all before you take that next step up, deciding you need something more. Such fantastic points, uh, Hannah, <clears throat> particularly about the context in which a beginner typically finds themselves in. <clears throat> That's fantastic. I, I want to point out or highlight one thing that you said, when you get a bike with a lot of suspension, it tends to be more initially soft and initially cushy uh, to use the term here that, um, that Chelsea shared with us. And I would kind of liken it to this and Chad, I'm sure you can relate to this as well as you've been a mountain biker that's ridden various different bikes, but also a strength trainer. If you were teaching a person to squat with proper technique or deadlift with proper technique, you wouldn't start them on a BOSU ball and give them a bar and have them go after it. Right. Like yeah, it's, fair point. It, it, it's so difficult to be able to learn the mechanics when everything underneath you is shifting and not very solid. And I feel that way about bikes with longer travel many times it's much more difficult to understand what the input or technique or technique changes you're making with your body are actually doing because they get lost and filtered through and diluted through the suspension travel in many cases. Uh, that's why it takes like what Hannah is saying, a whole lot more strength and, and confidence and surety in your movements and what you need to do to be able to enact the changes over your bike that need to happen when you're on a longer travel bike. It just, it takes more. So I, I completely agree. Fantastic advice. A hundred to 120, um, like, uh, the Trek top fuel would be a fantastic pick. Um, she was talking about the Epic Evo and there's so many bikes in that range from transition, from tons of brands from Yeti. They have years spoiled with choice in that group right now. So go shorter travel. It's awesome. Uh, Clara says I'm a Nike racer who struggles with starts. I'm a lot taller than most of the girls in my league. So I feel like I should be able to hold my position well, but I always have a hard time in the first few minutes. I also don't want to be too aggressive with my size. Uh, any tips? Great question. What would you say? Uh, I'm sure that you have experience, uh, and not only do you have experience racing as a pro, but perhaps even in Nika, I don't know. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I feel like I've gone across the whole spectrum here. Cause yes, racing Nika, racing collegiate, racing local races, racing world cups, racing pro CTs. And yeah, it, it all is a little bit different because, um, there's a different level of acceptance, but I think, you know, acknowledging it's important first that we acknowledge that starts are really important. Um, especially in the mountain bike. So yeah, this is a really great question. It's a really critical question also because starts are important they are hard for everybody, you know, like it, mm. I hear all the time, you know, starts are hard or starts are scary or both. And so mm. I'm really glad that we're talking about it. Um, and I think, you know, there's two, there's two elements to this question. First, there's your comment about aggressive ag aggression. Um, and then also holding your position. And I think the aggression aspect can lead to holding your position but it's also just, um, something to touch on. And then there's also the actual start, which if you have a really great start, you might not have to be as aggressive. So I think we need to talk about both of those things. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing is the aggression and I'm using the word aggression because that's the word that you used. I prefer the word assertive. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that there's a difference. So assertiveness is holding your line and not allowing anyone to push you over or push you around. Aggressiveness is going into someone else's space. And there can be a time and a place for both. But I think in general, what we want to be is assertive. We don't want to be pushed around. We don't want to crash. We don't want someone else dictating our race. So we need to be strong enough to hold our position and to be confident enough to do that. So that's what I'm thinking about when I start, I'm thinking about mm. holding my own space and creating more space for myself. So when I start, I want to keep my elbows really wide. 
um, because that is the greatest amount of space that I can create for myself. And then if someone else decides to come into my elbow, I'm not going to move it because they've made the decision to come there. They already saw that it was there and they'll need to deal with that situation. Um, Mm. now if I'm riding with my elbows in because I'm nervous and I'm not really sure what's going on and someone else comes into that space, it's too late. You don't want to flick your elbow out on them. You're going to be the one that creates the, creates the crash at the start. Um, and so it's being proactive by creating that space. Uh, so the other thing is you want to hold your line in a start, you know, first of all, to not create a crash but also to give yourself the best opportunity. So when you go off the line, you want to go straight and then you want to follow the course. If you're swerving around, that can create a problem. It also, that's another element of assertiveness. If someone comes into your space and they hit you and you're strong and you're not moving, they're more than likely to bounce off of you, especially if you're a a taller or, or bigger person because you're taller, they might just bounce off of you. If they come into you, and you are also moving or moving into them, or you choose to move because they're coming in, all of a sudden there's a a force. You're either pushing into each other or pushing away from each other. And that can also create crashes and also create elements where people are pointing fingers of, well, you came into me. Well, you pushed me. Well, you moved. And all of a sudden now we're like, was I too aggressive? Oh no, I'm so worried. Um, Mm -hmm. the other element finally is looking at whose handlebars are in front of whose, and this isn't something that I want you to over analyze, especially if you are a taller rider and your handlebars are higher than everyone else's, (laughs) it can be really difficult with the inches, but that's just a really simple way. You know, if it's very clear that your bars are in front of someone else, you're not responsible for their movements. So put it out of your mind. You're moving forward. You're you're doing the course, you're in the clear. If they're pushing into you from behind, that's on them. Just hold your line, let them bounce off of you. It's fine. If you're the one behind, you are the one who needs to execute the safe pass. So Mm. don't ride into them. Don't come by and slam into their bars on the way past. Wait for the hole, execute the pass well. Um, so those are my thoughts on assertiveness versus aggression. Um, Can I share one yeah, thing? Yeah, I was going to say, Hannah? someone please jump I, in. I struggle with this a lot because of if I'm on my bike, I'm representing Trainer Road. That's just the way it is. And I think because of growing up doing sports like hockey and then motocross in particular, uh, there's assertiveness and there's aggressiveness, and aggressiveness has to be a part of your strategy in both mm-hmm. of those sports. You have to take lines away. You have to do that. You have to be the one looking for advantage and the first one to take it. And, and mountain biking, I'm, I'm not afraid to do that. I feel confident doing that. But at the same time, I'm always worried that somebody's going to see that move and think what a jerk. I hate trainer road. Um, you know, because of that. And I'm sure you feel that with your sponsors as well too, like Hannah, like you don't want to, so it's tricky. There is a difference between being assertive and also there are times when racers make really aggressive moves. And while I may be taken back, I sit back and I go, that athlete just made the choice to make that move. And I didn't. So rather than be upset at them, this is racing. There is spot, there is room for aggressive stuff. If it's dangerous, that's one thing, Mm -hmm. but uh, there's a difference between being assertive, being aggressive and being dangerous. All three of those are very different, you know? Um, so, and there's a time and a place for all of them. I mean, at a world mm -hmm. cup, take or be taken over. It is no holds Mm. barred there, but at a Nike race, I think it is time to, to play your cards a little bit nicer. And also we're all people and there are opportunities to explain yourself, not in the race, but if something happens that seems questionable, I have even in a world cup, actually, I have at the finish line said, Hey, I just want you to know I made this decision because of X, Y, and Z. And I'm sorry that you seemed upset in the moment. I hope you understand that that was actually the best decision in the moment and they can take it or leave it, but (laughs) it's, it's a part of sport and, and you know, yeah, it's, yeah, we can't, we have to make the decisions. We have to fairly make decisions with the information that we have. 
And then we, and, and sometimes those are mistakes and we have to own those mistakes and other times they aren't mistakes. And you can't let other people's perspective on that, particularly if they were on the losing end of something, you can't let their perspective color that because especially being a taller rider, Clara, in this situation, you might always be the person that becomes the target for criticism that happens because taller riders are ones that are going to be able to control situations better. So then as a result, you could find yourself constantly being criticized. So please don't pay attention to it when it's not justified. Um, you know, be, have uh, take ownership of everything that you're doing and express radical candor with yourself. Those are two of our company core values, but, uh, express radical candor with yourself and others and, and, and make sure that you, um, are owning what you should own. Um, don't, don't feel bad. In other words, think, about when you <clears throat> I think there's another perspective we're not going to, we haven't considered yet is that look at it in the longer term, uh, in, in terms of how you want to be perceived by your fellow writers. Do you want to be seen as an assertive writer or an aggressive writer? Because both those things have their, their pros and cons. I mean, being labeled an aggressive writer can work for you. I find in most situations, it just, it, it doesn't. Being an assertive writer, I think almost always works for you. So I do agree that there are times where maybe a bit of aggression is merited. Mm. And, and I have never competed at the world level. So it's, it might be very different there. But I think in most cases, assertiveness makes sense and aggression seldom does. Yeah. And assertiveness can be perceived as aggression to some people, right? Mm -hmm. um, that that's what it is. But if you're holding your line and you are controlling your space, that's your space to own. Don't let anybody take it from you, you know? Um, but when you take somebody else's, that's when things get iffy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I like those barriers you defined around that Hannah. Uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, so that's kind of like the, the differences between those. What about the start, any mechanics or tips that you would give there? Yeah. And then I think, you know, if you have a really great start and you get out ahead of everybody, you don't even have to worry about any of this. So that's like <laughs> best case. Scenario. So just be first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just be first. So I think, um, I kind of came up with five strategies around start. So the first one is practicing start specific intervals. And this is something that I think is really unique to mountain biking is we, um, have to start really hard off the line, especially if there's a whole shot. And so we have to be used to going really hard and then being able to go back just 10% and then hold that. And so we, and so I think that's something that's really important to practice. And you can, I always go back to practice the demands of the sport. And so you can just think, what do I do in a start? Or even what your next race is specifically, maybe it's 30 seconds to the whole shot, practice 30 seconds all out and then back off and do the next 10 minutes at a seven out of 10 intensity or an eight out of 10 intensity. So practice that. It's a good way to make your seven feel like a 10, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Especially yeah. this is, you can do this based on effort or heart rate, but this is a great one to do, um, for wattages because yeah, it feels a lot harder <laughs> after that big effort. So yeah. yeah. The yeah. second one is, is pick good gearing. And that's something you might not know until you get to the course practice at least one start off the, the line to know what gear you should be in. There is nothing worse than pushing off of the line and watching everyone go ahead of you as you desperately try and shift into an easier <laughs> gear. It's also a good way to break a chain. So, um, number two, excuse me, number three, um, this is, maybe more people do it now, but I think this is my little secret. So, um, have the pedal flat, you know, like mm. it, when you're clipping in, don't have it crooked. Why would you add just a little bit of extra difficulty, have it flat so that it's in the perfect position when you push down and in that angle that you want to clip it in, have it be ready. Why not? It takes two seconds on the start line to just move your pedal into that position. Mm. Um, no, particularly four. helpful with like, uh, uh, crank brothers pedals, yeah. I would say too, like angle. I know that you think like it's an egg beater who cares, but angle really matters on those things, especially if you have the candies or the ones like that, because if that little egg beater is in a weird rotation with the rest of the pedal body on those candies, then it can be really hard to get into. So yeah, it's, it's such a small thing, but it's, that's a great tip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, bring your chest down to the bar. I see a lot of people, this might not be for everyone, but I see a lot of people on the start line sitting really upright and that might be how you ride, 
So it makes sense. But a lot of the time when we start, we, in order to have that big force, we pull down on our first, Mm. on our first pedal stroke. And so when the start whistle happens, we go from upright to down to back to upright and it, and it takes just a second. And so if you start Mm. already in that down position and you have your body in that powerful position to push down, you eliminate one of those movements. You can just push down in the pedal and then get into your riding position. So that's once again, just that little 1%. And something with that too, when you're dealing with those chest shifts and position, what you're doing is unweighting and weighting or varying the weight on your back wheel as well, which slotting out makes it so that obviously you're then going to get swallowed by everybody. It's going to make it tougher to clip in, could even make you tip over or cause a crash, something like that. So, uh, when you have your chest low note that she's not saying your chest forward, she's saying your chest mm-hmm. low, yes. when you put your chest low, what that ends up doing is it creates like a, it's uh, there's math things going on that I don't fully understand, mm-hmm. but I feel, but basically, uh, when you're doing that and you have your chest low, it's easy to be able to maintain a lot of tension through your bike. And when you can maintain tension through your bike, you can really have like a tight feedback loop with a really high refresh rate on what's going on with traction with your tire. You have tension through that chain, but tension through your body. So nothing's lost in between. Um, so you can maintain that all the way through. It's a really, that's a, that's a really good pro tip, subtle one and a big one. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that I think is really important to note is starting in the front is totally different than starting in the back and wherever you're starting, you want to have the best race you can have. So don't just think because you're starting in the back oh, none of this matters. Oh, it, it just means it's different. And I start in both positions. You know, I've in a lot of the U S races, I get to start in one of the first rows in the world cups. I think my toughest call up this year was like 83rd or something. So <laughs> I get it. It is so hard. And when you're on the front row, yeah, you want all of these things super dialed in the four things I just went through are super important to you. If you're in the back row, I think we have to go back to aggressive, assertive, dangerous, and think about, um, one of the things that I think is really helpful starting in the back is instead of listening, I mean, you're listening, but when the whistle goes off, a lot of people in the back try and move forward and it creates this weird, like slinky Mm -hmm. thing and people crash and you're track standing and Instead, I just look at the tire in front of me and when it starts rolling, I start rolling. And then I am not in this weird kind of track Mm. stand. I can just go with the momentum. And then after that, you're just try and just be on the highest alert possible. Open your visual field as wide as it can possibly be and look for holes everywhere. And when the hole opens, you're in it. But if there's no hole, there is no hole. You don't need to try and create one that can create issues. So you're on high alert for any openings that you can move your bike into. But when there is not an opening, you are trying to be as Zen as possible. And that's Mm. a place that I think can really help if we can use it correctly, because I know that there's a tendency, I know that there's a tendency (laughs) starting in the back be like, I have to move forward. I have to move forward. I have to move forward. And that is so much wasted energy. And then when it's time to move forward, you're like, man, I'm really tired. Um, yeah. and it's not because you've done anything. It's because you've been so excited to move forward. So you can just yeah. relax and rest when it does open up, you'll be the first one that's ready to move. And then it's so rewarding to pass, you know, 10 people at once with this great surge that you have in your body. Ironically, the way you move up from the back of the pack is not through your own, not because of power and not because of you putting out a lot of effort. It's because of you filling holes, just like you Mm -hmm. said, and because you've chosen to be the athlete that's aware and looking at where they're going to be. It's also good to anticipate bottlenecks, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you know that you have a really tight left-hander and you're line up in the back, that might mean that shifting yourself to the outside, if you have a tight 180 or something might be better because a lot of people will get stopped on the inside. You might be able to go around some. And it's more about like what Hannah says, ticking them off one at a time. Like, don't be so concerned with being at the front. Just be concerned with what the next move is right now Mm -hmm. for you, right? Like, and and that really helps control your mindset uh, or mindset with it. Those are awesome tips. Um, 
I only have one thing to add and it's, if there's something under, so when you get to the start line, uh, clean out underneath your tires, uh, that can be a really small thing, but if you pedal and then you've got a little rock right in front of your tire that then that spins out, it may, might mean you can't clip in well or something. Um, but what great tips we need to cut that into a, a quick clip. So then we can put that on there. Hannah's tips for a good start. That was awesome. Um, okay. We're going to go into some of the live questions that we've got. Um, that relate to this. The first one I wanted to get to is actually DJ's con uh, question. He says, so if we should avoid excess, so this is exactly identifying the fear that I had about people misunderstanding things here. Um, uh, uh, so it, he says, if we should avoid excess fueling for low intensity exercise, how long should a Z2 ride be before considering it, fueling it like a typical workout? hit the brakes. Uh, let's stop on this. Chad was talking about walking casually. Um, <laughs> so this is very different than a Z2 workout. And also Z2, I, I don't, I'm not sure it's really understood. So I'm just going to break down. I have three Z2 workouts that I've done recently. Okay. So one Z2 workout where my average power was 155 Watts that burned 560 calories in an hour. That's a lot of work that I was doing in that when at 155 Watts for an hour. That's, that's not like, I know that for you, it might feel easy on the bike, but your body's doing a lot of work still. Okay. Very different from going for a walk. That's mm -hmm. like entirely different. If you look at uh, something that's on the higher end of Z2, uh, did one that was 230 Watts and that burned all the way up to 1300 calories in an hour and a half. Um, so if you Z2, first of all, when you do it for an hour, even if you're at the top end of Z2, it's not comfortable. It's hard. And you're also likely sitting somewhere around, uh, your, your ventilatory thresholds, those, uh, those, uh, inflection points with your body and what it's doing, you're probably sitting somewhere around there when you're up at the top of Z2. So feeling that work can be important. Uh, remember just because you can get away with not feeling doesn't mean that you should also just because, and if it is a really easy day and it's not Z2 and we're talking zone one or something else, and maybe you don't need to feel it, then yeah, you probably don't need to feel it, but certainly don't be afraid to, and don't think that fueling a Z2 ride is going to somehow cause, uh, you know, metabolic dysfunction. That's far from it. Yeah. Um, Chad, I don't know if you have anything to add. Tim Poligar put an interesting study behind this very notion when he I mean, we know you can ride for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and you don't have to ingest anything. If you keep the intensity light enough, it doesn't mean it's the best way to train. It depends what you're chasing first off, but in terms of interrupting the policies or, or staving it off, it, Tim Poligar's research in this matter was, uh, I think it was an entirely low intensity ride, but either way, he started furnishing his system, started eating carbohydrates after 30 minutes. He found that past that 30 minute window, there was no reduction in the policies. So the first 30 minutes on un unfueled, didn't do anything. Then he started eating carbohydrates 30 minutes in intensity was low and his lipolysis kept on ticking, ticking along. So there is evidence to support that you, you, you don't necessarily interrupt it. Not the way we think it doesn't, we've, we've in the past tried to correct uh, a misstatement or a misunderstanding where simply introducing carbohydrate into the system shuts lipolysis off, shuts fat burning off. That's not the case. And if you wait, if you postpone it just a slight while, there's evidence to suggest that you don't affect it at all, that the, the policy just rolls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once again, one of those situations where it's not a system of mutually exclusive switches in our bodies, right? It's a system of faders. Um, our body is, is much more dynamic than that. So that answers like 17 out of 18 of the questions that we got, um, <laughs> because everybody wants us to say, starve yourself on the bike and pedal as long as you can and become fat adapted. And I know that's what you want us to say, but we're not going to say it because we push for health and performance. So no, that's, you're, you're verging into the territory of fasted rides and that's, that's a whole different conversation. Yep, exactly. Um, another question that's interesting. Somebody says, uh, my brother adopts the quotes. It's all about the macros approach and timing and context is everything. What are your thoughts on that form of fueling? Uh, I, I have some thoughts, maybe Hannah can share some, then we can go to Chad because I know Chad, I'm sure that you have some thoughts on that too. I think timing is really important. I think macros gen generally, uh, I don't even know if generally, Ma if you measure macros, it can be a great way to make sure that you're getting quality. Um, <clears throat> because sometimes if you just focus on calories, I see a lot of people do the thing where like, well, I can go get Popeye's chicken and eat that. And it's the same amount of calories, or I could go eat you know, six bowls of salad and get to the same amount of calories or something. 
And I, I see that tossed around more often when people are talking about just the overall calorie goal. Sure. But, um, yes, macros might help you focus more on quality, but I think that that's my main goal. Timing is important, but quality is the, so if macros works for you, cool. Um, Hannah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, um, I think that it is about macros, but I'm always hesitant when something like this is in quotation or as a phrase, it's all about the macros because with nutrition, you just never quite know what someone's getting at until you have a longer conversation. And I just think it's all about quality food. It's all about, you know, uh, optimizing performance. It's all about being a healthy person. So to say it's all about macros makes me put on the brakes just a little bit because I don't know what you're wanting to get out of those macros. But yeah, I think, I think I would definitely say macros is an excellent place to start or an excellent thing to track. Um, if you're looking for improvement in that area. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And I, I agree. And that it is, yes, it is all about the macros. And, and when you're, you're off the bike and you're trying to balance your macros to make sure you have sufficient protein for, you know, protein synthesis and sufficient fat for all the things that fat does and, and enough quality carbohydrate to move through your day and think sharply and have energy, then yep. You can get really reductive about it. And you can make it very specific, you know, 50, 20, 30 balance, whatever. But when it comes to fueling on the bike, it again is all about the macros. It's about one macro. It's about carbohydrate. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can ingest protein, a bit of it. You can ingest a bit of fat, but by and large, the work you're doing is going to be fueled by carbohydrate. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Great tips. Next one. Why does Jonathan look like he has an airplane pillow around his neck? I don't, <laughs> it's so cold in this room right now. And I thought it would off. get warmer. And it's my jacket and I'm really cold. I don't know what else to say. I'm sorry for all the people that I've distracted with wearing my jacket and the hood being bunched up like a neck pillow. I could have put my hood on, I guess, but that would have seemed really creepy. So, um, okay. Uh, another one that I want to cover with this, um, uh, this one is, is specifically Richard says, hello guys and gals. I have a question. I'm 52 and I've been racing a mountain bike and crits for over 25 years. Now I struggle the most with weight stress and or weight, he says stress and training plus work. How do you guys cope with this? Um, Hannah, I know that you're, uh, I want to dispel the myth that like pro athletes have a perfectly distilled life where it's just like, I just get to focus on the bike. You've also balanced it with, uh, school and everything else. Um, so maybe just some quick, we did talk about managing stress earlier, but maybe some quick tips on prioritization and keeping all those plates spinning in the air, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I think you just nailed it with that word prioritization. It's um, knowing your priorities and then being confident in those priorities, having conviction with those priorities. You know, for most people, even professional athletes, let's be real, like there should be something in your life more important than your bike. You know, even if it's your health, if it's a family member, you know, there are things that are more important. Um, but regardless there, if you're not a professional athlete, there might be a whole list of things more important and acknowledging that and being okay with that is fine. You know, when those, when, so, you know, if these five things interrupt my ride, it's okay. And then you have to be stressed about that. Um, but if these things interrupt your ride, it's, it's also having the conviction to say, no, I've decided that riding today is more important than in this. And then I think, so having conviction with those, with those things, and then, uh, planning your day around it to the best of your abilities. For me, I've always performed really well with a very regimented and, and strict schedule, you know, I, and it, and it changes as life goes on. But on college, I, in college, I literally had every 15 minutes of my day planned out and that's mm -hmm. what worked for me. And it's different. It is different for everybody, but that's how I eliminate stress is knowing what I'm supposed to be doing when I'm doing it. And then all I'm doing is following along. And that has helped me a lot. Mm. Chad, do you have any uh, tips that you share with this? Just, uh, I think Hannah nailed it. Prioritization. You have to decide what's most important because most of the time you're not going to be able to do all of it. And, and that's just how it is. You have to decide 
what's more important trying to do all of it all the time is just going to run you down and everything's going to suffer. So, mm -hmm. you know, table certain things at certain times and emphasize the things that are most important. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Your priorities will shift, right? Like, uh, too, at different times, like don't expect them to be static and don't force yourself to adhere to those constantly in some respects, one day to the next one priority may take more precedent over another. That's just how it goes. Um, and for sure, Richard, I, I can completely empathize too, because I spend days where it, these things hang over me all day. I feel like I have to check every single box. And by the end of the day, if I haven't checked a couple of those boxes that hangs on me. So you have to learn to cut loose of all of those obligations, determine which ones are most important and just accept that you're not always going to be able to get to all of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And talk to the people in your life about those priorities, not only for them to hold you accountable, but so that they can honor them as well so that they know, Hey, I'm going, you know, I'm going to prioritize you, but today I'm not going to prioritize the dishes because for me, I need to get this ride in, you know, whatever it is. I just think that that communication is really important because when people know what's important to you and they love you and they support you, they're most likely also going to want to prioritize what you're prioritizing. Even just externalizing it for what, for yourself will feel really good because likely it will be some sort of internal conflict, uh, trying to decide what you're going to do and what you're going to prioritize. And just externalizing sometimes feels great. Um, mm -hmm. whether that's through doing it through a calendar or an accountability partner, whatever it might be, can be really helpful. Um, fantastic stuff. The last one from Forrest just says, does Jonathan have any quick tips for avoiding training setbacks due to your young children being, uh, bringing home and sharing constant colds from school? And I put this one in order because once again, priorities Forrest. um, uh, you can't make yourself be some sort of bulletproof athlete if your child's constantly making you sick. And that's, that happens. That's how it goes. They make you sick. They're sick. That's just what it's like. Uh, I think from ages one through three, almost with our son, it was, uh, geez, basically I think, uh, we counted because in the first two years, it was like 50 something times he came down with something unique. Um, and, and that's, that's normal. That's just what kids go through and you'll get it as a parent. So in those times, Forrest, don't make yourself, don't worry about training setbacks. Just give your family and yourself the attention that you need and just know that, Hey, I might get slower for a while. That's okay. Just that's fine. <laughs> uh, if you try to make yourself train through all that, you're only going to make everything much, much more difficult for yourself. Um, but simple things like washing hands goes a long way and doing that regularly and <clears throat> instilling that, <clears throat> forgive me, instilling that habit in your children. <clears throat> Um, and man, I'm probably going to poke a hornet's nest with this one, but I will say ever since our son's been wearing masks at school, it's been amazing because he doesn't get <laughs> sick as often. So like, uh, the common colds and sniffles seem to have disappeared. So, um, but I thought it's all I'm going to touch on that topic. Uh, I won't go any deeper there. So, uh, okay. Thanks everybody for joining us on this episode. We covered a lot of things that are probably going to inspire a whole lot of questions in you. So please go to trainerroad.com slash podcast and express those questions to us, whatever they might be. Uh, you can do that. And then we'll be able to cover those on a future episode of the podcast. We'll have time to be able to build those up because it's from here on out. I think for quite a while, it's going to be Cape Epic focused for quite a few weeks here. Um, Chad, you'll be, you'll be on a podcast vacation of sorts. Um, so, and then we'll be not very much on a podcast vacation or a bike racing vacation. It's going to be some hard work and some execution going on. So uh, stay tuned for that. It's going to be exciting. Next week, we're going to have the replacements for Chad and Pete's team uh, that are going to be on Ross and Rob, two of our employees that we've um, just recently, we've opened an office in South Africa, <clears throat> which we're super excited about with our awesome CFO, Madeline there and tons of employees and Ross and Rob are extremely fast mountain bikers, way faster than the rest of us. And they're going to be racing Cape Epic as well. And they're locals. So what a cool experience. Um, and we'll be talking all about that and then doing daily check-ins with Sean, who you will also meet next week. Uh, one of our awesome copywriters. So stay tuned for that. Follow us on Instagram, go check out the trainer road blog and sign up for trainer road. Go check out Hannah's Instagram. She puts out awesome training tips on Tuesdays in particular and just great content in general. And we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody.